in transition to endemicity and how best we should respond. To begin, let us listen to the welcoming remarks by UITM's Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation, Yang Babaragia Professor Technologist Dr. Muhammad Nazib Suratman, who unfortunately cannot be with us live this morning, but has prepared his welcoming remarks um, previously. So, Secretariat, please um, play the remarks. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning. Excellencies, colleagues, and ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of UITM, I thank all panelists and all for joining this seminar. I especially thank the Research Management Center of UITM under the leaderships of Yang Berbahagia Datuk Profesor Dr. Abu Bakar Abdul Majid for organizing this event. As someone once said, the show must go on. Not that this is a show, but I appreciate efforts of all participants to be together virtually today. We are here truly as one community. We do our best when we do it together. So this is a good step in the right direction to exchange ideas and forge synergy between all of us for one of the goals we want to achieve. Know your endemic, know your response, which is the theme of today's webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, a virus not visible to the naked eye has put the world on pause. It has put into questions how and where to go from here. The COVID-19 virus knows no boundaries, no race, no religion. Everybody, every country grapples with the immediate needs of this public health crisis. We are hoping to see some good practices and successful policy initiatives adopted by respective countries, giving people much needed optimisms and hope for a recovery. Yes, we all experience unprecedented situations with the pandemic. However, unprecedented crisis also presents opportunities for innovations. The development of the testing kit that produces results in less than 10 minutes is inspiring. Some countries apply the lesson learned from their experiences in Ebola preparedness. They deploy rapid response team, train contract traces, head logistic routes, and public health protocols ready to contain community spread. I would once more like to thank all panelists for sparing your precious time to share your thoughts and experiences in this webinar. On that note, I wish everyone a productive and fruitful session, and I look forward to hearing your discussions and learning from your insight. Thank you. Thank you, Yang Bahagia Professor Technologist Dr. Muhammad Nazib Suratman. Ladies and gentlemen, next let us hear from Yang Mubahagia Professor Datuk Dr. Abu Bakar Abdul Majid, Director of UITM's Research Management Centre, as he sets the scene from pandemic to endemic, know your response. Please welcome Yang Mubahagia Datuk. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Umi. Uh, very good morning to our esteemed speakers, to participants, fellow professors, uh, lecturers, UITM, and from all over. Hopefully, there are also the public attending because basically this event is aimed at reaching out to the public on. Uh, matters of uh, importance currently, which is the 
transition of our pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic to uh, endemic phase, to the endemic phase. Um, basically, I would like to thank uh, Yang Bagai Prof uh, Nazib, uh, the Deputy Vice Chancellor for uh, agreeing to give the welcoming speech. Thank you so much. And it's a very useful um, observation for us to um, to consider and probably take action. Um, the basically the research management center is under the deputy the office of deputy vice chancellor for research and innovation, and we try to um, emphasize on this uh, ability of our, our lecturers, uh, as mentioned by Professor Nazib on innovation. So we have this so-called uh, tagline, we say create, curate, and translate. And this is one example of uh, an activities which aim to translate whatever information, whatever um, data that we have, that we have curated for us to share and disseminate or translate that into uh, the public for reality. Um, I would like to share some slides as to prepare the scene for our webinar this, this morning. Um, Okay, thank you. So basically, um, we have uh, developed this uh, phrase, which we have uh, adopted from the United Nations uh, Joint Committee for HIV AIDS. Know your endemic, know your response. Basically, as we understand or we gain information from the specialists, from the experts, then we can take measures to try to respond to the current uh, or the move from the uh, pandemic to endemic stage. As I mentioned, we hope that uh, we can uh, use this uh, opportunity to translate information to the public, especially uh, the form of our trans translational research uh, somewhat. Because I think uh, the major objective of this particular event is really to reach out to the public, to inform the public of the importance or the need uh, for actions or responses during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the basic question is, of course, uh, what does that mean? And today we have assembled a group of uh, speakers to tell us what uh, moving from or shifting from pandemic to endemic means. In the meantime, if we revisit the so-called COVID-19 manners, uh, we were about to start the year 2020, that was towards the end of December 2019, when people were talking about Decade of Hope after having been through a quite a um, um, tough decade of 2010 to 2019. But from Decade of Hope, it seems that this decade started um, to become probably like a tumultuous decade. Because on the same day, on the 31st uh, December 2019, just as people were waiting for the countdown to the new year, there was a report from Wuhan in China of several cases of uh, novel virus infection at that time. And this was later named COVID-19. Um, however, during the conflict, uh, the, I mean, during conflicting reports, because most countries decided to take a wait and see approach, basically. and uh, several weeks actually passed before um, measures, even then it was not really strong measures, measures were taken. And the discussion then, of course, it was a trade-off between health and the economy, the, the famous life versus livelihood uh, debate. Uh, because of that uh, so-called inertia or late in response, then it was uh, discovered later on hindsight that we actually lost 
the opportunity to nip COVID-19 in the bud, like what happened to previous SARS. Um, this was uh, declared by the United uh, WHO. So because of our lateness in response, so now we have no choice but to live together. And this is uh, data from John Hopkins and the latest from Malaysia, although things are looking a bit more rosy, but definitely uh, we still have to be on our guards. Numbers uh, seems to be going down. Uh, basically, of course, uh, if we want to have a very uh, bird's eye view of what uh, the difference between endemic and uh, epidemic and pandemic uh, is, so this uh, very simple uh, cartoon shows the different uh, phases uh, of uh, from pandemic, which is on the, the right, where cases are all over the world. Now it's probably moving to more specified or targeted areas uh, in the globe. Uh, the experts, I'm sure, will uh, delve into this one in, in much greater detail. So I think for us to move forward during the endemic uh, stage of COVID-19, the three Ps uh, can be our guide. Of course, with the ability of uh, us to predict um, from previous data and also through modeling, there'll be better prediction of the um, possibility of cases uh, turning up in some parts of the, the country, for example. Uh, this uh, prediction, I'm sure, is going to be improved by statistics, uh, by our uh, experience, and also, of course, the learning curve that we have gone through. And from the prediction, then, as uh, public, as the masses, we need to practice what is uh, advice upon us. And with this practice, which we know very well now what we have to do, at least those basic um, requirements that we have been advised to, uh, to practice, these are, this seems to be quite uh, effective. And then we hopefully can prevent the spread of uh, COVID-19 like we experienced previously. So predict something that we can very well do. Practice is what we're going to emphasize further and hopefully we achieve our target of preventing COVID-19 uh, increase in, in cases and especially uh, preventing number of deaths. So today we have lined up uh, speakers. Uh, I believe uh, we have thought about this uh, program Basically, what we intend to do is to bring in public health uh, experts to talk about what endemic means. This is from their experience, from their practice. And then we also have uh, from the pharmaceutical services, how the pharmacists were involved in the as frontliners and also those have been in the ICU and also especially in uh, coming up together with the team. Uh, healthcare team coming up with uh, treatments. I'm sure having gone through this uh, uh, management of COVID-19 cases, there have been numerous uh, attempts to try to provide the best solution in terms of uh, therapy. There could have been lots of uh, trials and, you know, and tribulations, I'm sure, in terms of treatment. We also uh, brought in a bio, biomedical scientist who is very active in doing research. So beyond COVID-19 pandemic, in terms of vaccine development, what should be our strategies? Where should we be targeting? Are we expecting further um, um, viruses, uh, the, the coronaviruses, uh, more, probably more, um, serious cases uh, in terms of infection, or are we going to see even other types or other forms of viruses that can bring havoc, like what uh, COVID-19 has done to us? So are we going to develop vaccine based on the previous strategies, or should we open up our horizon and think about more broad spectrum uh, vaccines? 
And uh, finally, today, uh, um, we are so happy to have uh, with us Professor Dr. Azim Majid from Imperial College in London. Uh, he's been active, um, actively involved in discussing issues pertaining to uh, COVID-19 pandemic. He's been a very active uh, writer in BMJs, the blog, blog BMJs and, and, and also journals. Um, the thing about uh, Prof Azim, we want him to share with us the experience of how the situation is being managed in England. I think England is quite uh, extraordinary in the sense that um, if you, I mean, if you see the people there, I, I probably know from um, watching soccer on TV now, the English Premier League, where you see people in the stadium in huge, in big numbers, and there's no social distancing, obviously, and there's no usage of masks. Um, I'm not sure whether this is considered to be uh, the practice during the pandemic, which most likely not, but uh, this is happening in London. But on the other hand, although uh, um, the situation seems a bit more relaxed, there, but if you go to um, facilities, like you go to um, buildings, uh, they still have, you have to still have to practice this uh, um, normal uh, check on your, your temperature and also have to ensure putting on the mask. Um, but today, this morning, I heard on BBC that uh, there is already cause to impose restrictions uh, in England with regard to movement and also uh, with regard to um, SOPs uh, in view of the increasing number of cases, positive cases, uh, which uh, they target or they predict can reach 100,000 per day. So, like I said, things in the UK is a bit uh, complex. Um, so, we want to hear from Prof. Asim what's happening really and how are the um, people in charge in the UK and also the practitioners how they're facing this uh, situation and how they are reacting to or responding to it. So, uh, thank you so much to all the speakers. Uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Sekali Ibrahim uh, and then Associate Professor Dr. Siti Maria and Dr. Aliza alias Dr. Liao Chun Yi and also Prof. Dr. Azim Majid. And thank you also to the moderator Associate Professor Dr. Zaleha, Professor Dr. Taylor King, and also Professor Dr. Anis uh, Safura. Um, by the way, uh, they are they are all also very close to my heart because these are the people that have been assisting and helping UITM um, in one way or another uh, in the past uh, many years. So I wish you all a wonderful webinar. Uh, very useful uh, sharing of information and we hope, as I think Prof. Nasib also wishes, that beyond the webinar, there will be collaborations between faculties, between institutions, and especially between nations. So, good luck, have a great time. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Yang Bahagia Datuk, for the recap of COVID-19 and also sneak peek into the coming topics that will be discussed this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, this webinar will be held in three sessions, each moderated by UITM's very own experts, um, as introduced by Yang Bahagia Datuk. Yeah. So, without further ado, to kick off session one, please welcome Associate Professor Dr. Zaliha Ismail. She is the Head of Department of Public Health, Faculty of Medicine, University of Azumara. Dr. Zaliha, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Tawumi. Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and salam sejahtera. You all can hear me, right? Yes, loud and clear. Yeah, okay. So, um, yang berbahagia Datuk Dr. Abu Bakar Majid, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for Datuk for inviting me as uh, the uh, moderator. So, to all the panelists, uh, professors, uh, doctors, lecturers, ladies and gentlemen, 
as most of us know, Malaysia is expected to enter the endemic stage of the COVID-19 at, at the end of October. So meaning that the COVID-19 will be with us for at least a few years to come. So we have to live with the new norm, living and working with the COVID-19. So um, the question is, are we ready to enter the pandemic phase? Okay, so today we are trying to get all the answers or information on these issues from our speakers. Uh, in my session, we have two fortunate uh, speakers. Uh, with, we will be talking on the first one is pandemic to the endemic, the race against time. Is Malaysia ready? And the second one is a challenges and workplace strategies for COVID-19 endemic era. So first of all, I would like to introduce the, our first speaker, Datuk Dr. Khalid bin Ibrahim. Datuk Dr. Khalid bin Ibrahim is a graduated from the University of Malaya in a Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery MBBS. And he started his career as a medical officer in Hospital Kota Baru before pursuing his master's in Hospital and Health Service Management at South Bank University of London. In 2018, he became the Selangor State Health Director. Before that, he served as Hospital Director at Hospital Tanah Merah and Hospital Sungai Bulo. So uh, for me, he became a leader under the Ministry of Health at the very young age. So he also a well-known speaker in motivation and a leadership trainer for the Ministry of Health and actively involved in the quality programs at the national level, Ministry of Health, and also a chairman of various steering committee at the Ministry of Health. Another, another significant contribution in his involvement is in international humanitarian aids around the globe. Currently, he is the uh, lecturer at the Department of Public Health Medicine. So without further ado, I would like to um, invite Professor, uh, Professor, sorry, one day we'll become a professor, right? Okay, I would like to invite the Dato uh, uh, Khaled Ibrahim to give uh, your views on the topic. Okay, Dato. Thank you very much, um, Professor Zaleha and um, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh. Um, very good morning to all the um, uh, my fellow colleagues and all the participants in and um, in this program. Right. Um, my topic today is the uh, pandemic uh, to endemic the race against times. Is it uh, Malaysia ready for that? Right. Um, as a prof, uh, um, Baka told us just now the classification of pandemic, epidemic or endemic. I would like to um, uh, share again with you the um, the basic uh, definition of the um, epidemic, pandemic and, and endemic. Um, before this, um, uh, um, public maybe don't know about the uh, um, um, the real definition of uh, epidemic, pandemic and endemic. But now, um, even uh, uh, my grandchild also can say um, uh, pandemic. But um, I don't think he really understand what is the, the, the pandemic. And also the public uh, also, um, um, maybe after two years, they uh, started to uh, understand uh, the, the, the word of um, epidemic and pandemic and also endemic. But um, recently, um, our our minister um, did mention that we will be moving into the uh, um, endemic phase, and um, a few a few countries in the world already um, mentioned that we need to live uh, with um, with COVID for maybe two or three years uh, or or even uh, five years uh, ahead of us. Okay, uh, next slide. Right. Um, this is uh, the definition by uh, CDC uh, Atlanta. But um, even though we classify the pandemic, epidemic, or endemic, um, the uh, you, we must remember that the terminology uh, does not change anything about the severity of the disease 
or how uh, we responding? Just the, I mean, uh, only the definition. Um, if you look into the cycle of the diseases, um, usually we'll, we'll start with the outbreak, the epidemic, pandemic, and also the uh, uh, that is endemic. And the epidemic is an increase often sudden in the number of cases of disease above what is normally expected in that population in that area. Uh, if you are looking into the COVID-19, um, as uh, uh, we know that the uh, the outbreak started uh, in Wuhan, and then uh, um, become the the, the um, epidemic at the uh, uh, um, in China. Uh, later, it became a pandemic uh, because uh, uh, um, many countries in the world are suffering from the uh, um, COVID-19. Then, uh, when we say the pandemic, refer to an epidemic that has spread over several countries or continents, usually affecting a large number of people. We know that uh, even in our country also, um, it will be affected more than 2 million people, uh, not uh, with other countries. Um, endemic is um, um, the word that we must uh, um, take into consideration is that observed level of the disease within the population. So the definition of observed level is depend on the uh, um, depend on uh, the country. So uh, or the constant present and or usual prevalence of disease or infection agent within a ge geographical bounds uh, population, and because the um, the endemic can be uh, um, in one country or geographical bound population like may maybe we can endemic in South Asia. Southeast Asia, uh, but not uh, endemic in, in, in other continents. Um, but uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, even though, um, <laughs> we must remember that the terminology does not change anything about the severity of the disease or how we are uh, um, responding to, to this type of epidemic, pandemic, or endemic. Next slide, please. All right, uh, this is a uh, um, I mean, um, simpler uh, the definition of endemic um, um, of a disease or condition regularly found among particular people or in in, in, in certain area. Epidemic is a, um, a widespread occurrence of uh, an infection disease in an community at a particular time. Uh, and a pandemic is um, prevalence uh, over the whole country or, or the world. Next slide. This is a, um, I mean, uh, um, very easy to understand. Um, uh, endemic um, transmission occur, but the number of cases remain constant. And in epidemic, the number of cases increase. Uh, we're talking about pandemic when uh, when epidemic occurs at several continents, at global epi or in in another word, it's a global epidemic. Um, we must remember uh, right. that, uh, when we talk about uh, endemic, the um, transmission still occur, but the number of cases remain cost constant. So what is the number? Um, what is the number for Malaysia so that uh, we can declare the endemic? That is the question that um, um, everybody um, uh, asking. Um, the public uh, asking the, the government uh, 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 or the uh, ask the specialists what is the number uh, numbers that uh, we want to count uh, um, to become the the endemic uh, 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 in in our country. Next, right? The um, when we're talking about the endemic future, our future endemic. Um, in uh, nature polls, um, 89% uh, of scientists felt that the COVID-19 was either very likely uh, or likely to become an endemic virus. And um, the virus become, uh, becoming endemic is likely, but the pattern that it will take is hard to predict. 
that's the the uh, uh, I mean, uh, we have to uh, bear in our mind that um, uh, it will um, it will take uh, it's hard to uh, to predict. Is it um, we will live in, in endemic uh, for five years from now? That is a question uh, we would like to ask uh, ourselves and to, to ask the uh, public specialists and to ask the scientists. Uh, is it um, when um, become an endemic? Is it uh, the virus become a childhood, uh, childhood virus? That means um, they only uh, um, affect the, the, the children because uh, right now uh, we start uh, to, to vaccinate um, our, our school age um, from 12 years old to 17, but not yet below, the, uh, below 12. So um, maybe in, um, maybe we, we can say that it will become the childhood um, virus that will affect the, the, the childhood because uh, um, the five years old not yet uh, be covered by a vaccination. Or is it similar to flu? It becomes seasonal flu. Uh, then we, uh, we have to take the, 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 uh, the vaccine uh, annually. Or uh, is, it, uh, is it like uh, become a measles-like uh, virus? This is uh, a question that uh, I mean, uh, a lot of scientists and also public health specialists uh, um, asking uh, whether uh, what is the the, the um, endemic future for for us. Next slide, please. All right. Um, what is the usual path from pandemic to endemic look like? So um, when we uh, when we to move to pandemic to endemic, um, we, we must uh, look into three uh, factors. Huh? The three factors that uh, determine um, whether uh, we can move from uh, pandemic to endemic um, are host, environment, and virus factors. So uh, when we are talking about the host, uh, because we know that uh, the virus uh, uh, it is infecting human host with no prior immunity. Uh, so uh, who is the one that uh, no prior immunity? Usually, those who I mean do have comorbid. Uh, usually, those who not no uh, comorbid or those who not yet exposed to be the disease. So um, uh, in this case. Um, the vaccination um, uh, become a private role in 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 in, in determining uh, the uh, whether uh, we can be infected or not, and also uh, the um, so-called the natural immunity um, uh, because of of um, exposed to the uh, uh, infection uh, of COVID. The second thing is that um, uh, the factor that determine. Uh, whether we want to move to pandemic to endemic, is that the environment. So um, we know that uh, the virus transmit better in cold. That's why um, right now uh, in, uh, um, uh, in Europe right now, especially in UK, um, if you listen to BBC this morning, uh, I think the, the, the cases uh, uh, jump into 40,000 uh, uh, a day. Uh, then, uh, we know that the virus transmit better in cold and dry, and also the crowded area, and also close contact, and in confined settings with poor ventilation. Uh, the, the, um, so um, um, less uh, transmission in uh, in open space, uh, in um, in uh, in open space. Then. Um, the third uh, factors that uh, we have to look into is the, is the virus itself. So, um, because the virus has its own characteristic, that's why uh, um, the issue right now is a uh, issue of VOC, various of uh, um, variant of concern. Uh, they can replicate and mutate and become a, a, a more uh, virul uh, virulent uh, strains. So. Um, um, 
the a few question uh, man, uh, many uh, expert uh, have said that um um uh, they expect that covid-19 to become an endemic disease but the how does a disease uh, go from being acute to endemic and what factors that shape the transition to endemicity and what is likely timeline for covid-19 to become endemic that is question that they pose it to me uh, to me the 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 expectation the covid-19 will become endemic essentially mean that the pandemic will not end uh, with the virus uh, disappearing and instead uh, the the optimistic view is that 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 enough people will gain immune protection from uh, vaccination and from natural infections such as that uh, such as uh, that there will be a less transmission and much less covid-19 related um, hospitalization and death even as the virus continue to, to circulate the expected continued circulation of SARS-CoV-2 stands in, in contrast with the first round of the SARS in 2003 and with the Ebola virus outbreak in West Africa in 2014 when public health measures ultimately stopped spread and brought both outbreak to an end while there are important differences among the viruses and and the context this comparison uh, underscores the critical need to improve our global public health infrastructure and surveillance system to monitor for uh, and help respond to the inevitable next potential pandemic virus since uh, viruses spread where there are enough susceptible individual and enough contact among them to sustain spread it's hard to anticipate what the timeline will be the expected shift of COVID-19 to endemicity. It depends on factors like strength and the duration of immune protection from vaccination and also natural infection, our pattern of contact with one another that allows spread, and also the transmissibility of the virus. These are the, 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 the dependent factors that determine uh, the shift uh, from pandemic to uh, um, to uh, endemicity so um, the pattern um, will likely differ considerably from what we saw with other pandemic because of the heterogeneous response to COVID-19 across the world with some places engaging in zero COVID policies others with limited responses and widely variable vaccine availability and uptake so um, this is uh, um, um, the, 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 the issue of um, um, the, uh, we cannot predict uh, for sure the, when is the, um, we can move into the uh, endemicity. Uh, the other question that people um, like to ask is what does history tell us about how deadly virus such as COVID-19 can over time become a manageable threat? Huh? What does history tell us about how deadly virus such as COVID-19 can over time become a manageable threat. So uh, we know a few respiratory viruses that were introduced into a human population swept across the globe and transitioned to endemic circulation, usually with annual winter time peaks in incidence. The example most commonly uh, invoked these days is uh, the 1918 flu pandemic caused by an H1N1 influenza virus. But there are other more recent examples from influenza that in 1957, flu pandemic caused by a H2N2 influenza virus. 1968, flu pandemic from a H3N2 influenza virus. And in 2009, the swine flu pandemic from an H1N1 influenza virus. So the, the, the the pandemic generally began with infection fatality rates higher than observed in the years following their introduction as the virus continued to circulate. While declining, uh, declining fatality rates after pandemic may be due to a number of factors. One likely key contributor is that the first round of exposure to a pathogen confers some degree of protection against reinfection and severity of disease of reinfection does occur. Vaccine come for protection in much the same way as the data from COVID-19 vaccine has demonstrated. 
and um, people will ask, uh, what is the likelihood that we will need a booster shot every year? So uh, uh, this uh, this also um, depend on the uh, the uh, quality of, of of the vaccine uh, in in uh, the population. Um, the past pandemic have led to massive changes in the way we live that we have come to accept as normal. Screen uh, on our doors and windows help keep our mosquito that carry yellow fever and malaria. Sewer system and access to clean water help eliminate typhoid and cholera epidemics. Perhaps the lesson learned from COVID-19 in terms of disease prevention can yield similar long-term improvement in, in, in individual and global health. Next slide, please. Um, it won't be the same of uh, everywhere. Country will not enter an endemic phase at the same time because of because of variable host, uh, environmental, virus factor, and including the vaccination rate. The poor vaccine coverage could allow the virus to continue at an epidemic level for longer, and. If that I mentioned just now, the booster dose just now, if immunity wanes quickly, no booster shot, then COVID-19 uh, would go from endemic to pandemic again. So once we see a stable of COVID transmission uh, indicating a new baseline of COVID-19, we will know the pandemic has ended and the virus is endemic. So the word is that the new baseline so what is our baseline what um, in Malaysia that we would like to declare the, the, the endemic? So we need to see the, um, uh, the pattern of the, uh, uh, the, the pattern, the, the number of cases in, in Malaysia. Next slide. So um, as, um, as I mentioned just now, the, the, what is the baseline? So let's uh, uh, let look into the um, National Recovery Plan, NRP. Uh, everybody knows that we do have the four phases. Is it the National Recovery Plans uh, took the road to endemic in Malaysia? Because uh, we know that um, the three headline indicators inside the uh, National Recovery Plan is that the number of daily new cases uh, from uh, phase one, uh, uh, more than 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, and in phase four, supposed to be around 500. So is it the 500 is the baseline figure that we can declare uh, if that um, that um, will be, uh, our country will be in the endemic phase? That is the question that um, maybe uh, Minister of Health or the government will answer. Uh. And, and um, of course, um, the second headline indicates that the, uh, the utilization of uh, ICU beds. So we can see right now the declination of the uh, utilization of uh, ICU beds. And also um, the percentage of eligible population fully vaccinated. So we can see right now the, um, the adult vaccination uh, ratio 94, 95%. Uh, the, um, Adolescents right now, the fully vaccinated uh, achieve 25 percent, but for total po population, that means uh, including the uh, the adult and adolescent right now is around uh, 70 percent. But the um, as we declare, uh, we did mention that we're going to move to herd immunity if uh, um, we can reach the uh, 80 percent of um, full uh, population fully vaccinated. Uh, so this national recovery plan actually uh, uh, defining a new approach of safe reopening. Uh, uh, so um, it become the basis to monitor under uh, under uncertainty. That means uh, under uncertainty from um, pandemic to uh, to move to uh, endemic phase. Next slide. All right, the um, people are also asking. What is the culture in inverted commas that during a uh, during endemic? So um, um, even though we let's say that our country moved to uh, to endemic, 
the the basic rules um, uh, make SMS your habit that is uh, um, uh, sanitize, uh, mask, and also social distancing. That is the 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 um, is a uh, uh, is a new norm, uh, a new normal uh, in our life, even though uh, uh, in uh, endemic era. And the most important that we should practice on our own test, isolate, treat, and quarantine. Because uh, that's why uh, the government already approved the uh, the so-called uh, individual um, um, RTK saliva testing. So um, um, the the testing should be uh, should become a culture in 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 our life. An example, uh, um, usually um, we treat ourselves with. Um, we treat uh, uh, um, um, our family um, on our own example when we do have flu, we give the uh, uh, paracetamol, the kind of thing. Uh, we ask them to take a vitamin C. So um, in endemic era, if you do have the, uh, uh, the flu, so um, you should uh, test on um, doing the, the self-testing. This is uh, uh, the, the culture that uh, during endemic and become, uh, that, that's why and the government put a, a ceiling price uh, to this uh, uh, test kit. So um, if it's positive, then we should isolate ourselves and also we, we should uh, quarantine. So this is a, 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 a culture that we should practice. And um, of course, uh, we should in, uh, increase in, um, we should uh, increase our knowledge and uh, we should improve our attitude and toward the, the uh, COVID-19. And of course, the last one is the uh, staying uh, safe. Next slide, please. Uh, talking about the loss of, of Malaysia, um, is it the, the, the Act of 342, Prevention and Control of Infection Disease, uh, Act 1918, still uh, applicable during the uh, endemic? The answer is yes. Because uh, um, as we know, um, the laws of Malaysia is uh, uh, for the Act uh, 342. The, um, we do have a section one to section 33. Um, under section 31, power to make regulation, the Minister of Health. So that means um, during this endemic, during, um, the Minister uh, has the power to make any regulation in relation to the uh, um, this diseases, this disease. So um, uh, under section 25 also um, um, compounding offense, offenses. Uh, so um, uh, the DG have the right uh, to, uh, to, uh, to impose that. So uh, any regulation made under this act. So that means uh, the uh, uh, section 25, we refer to section 31. That means uh, if any regulation then uh, uh, will provide the uh, compound offenses. So um, um, compound offenses such as uh, we don't wear the um, uh, mask, uh, we don't uh, mean, uh, mean uh, do the, the social distancing still, uh, still um, apply. Next slide. I think this is uh, my, um, my last slide, um, my last, uh, uh, um, I mean, uh, a way forward to me, um, the long-term goal, work to reach a manageable endemic state. Uh, I mean, uh, what is the work to reach a, a manageable endemic state? The status that, that we want is that minimal cases, so uh, we must develop the new baseline. Is it we want to follow the uh, 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 National Recovery, Recovery Plan just now, uh, NRP that I, I did mention, the baseline for phase four is uh, less than 500. That's depend on the uh, the government. So minimal cases, new baseline, and surveillance in place to identify the outbreak. That is very important. Um, during endemic, the outbreak can happen. Then the outbreak can uh, bring into a, 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 a epidemic and uh, um, pan, uh, maybe a pandemic again if. Um, same um, thing that happened in, in, in other countries. So our key metric is that to reduce the daily COVID-19 cases to a manageable level 
and break the link with the hospitalization. So uh, to me, um, I'd like to uh, to mention that the, um, as a Prof. Um, Bakar uh, mentioned just now, predict, practice, and prevent. So uh, the policy that in relation to that, uh, to me, is that uh, we must strategically vaccinate the population as quickly as possible, uh, 12 years and above. Maybe later when the uh, vaccine is um, available for the for the uh, lower age, lower than uh, 12, then um, the country also um, uh, can practice that. Uh, second thing is that we must expand the genomic sequencing uh, uh, um, or surveillance testing and rapid diagnosis to uh, quickly identify and curtail the outbreak. That's why uh, I we did mention the 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 uh, self testing just now. Rapid diagnostic to quickly identify and curtail the uh, the outbreak. And fourth is that we must invest in transmission reducing measures. Um, very simple one. Uh, maybe um, um, I think in UK right now they uh, uh, do research on the mucosal mucosal vaccines. Um, no need to take in, uh, uh, injection, but uh, or oral uh, vaccine or or, or uh, medicine or spray uh, um, nasal uh, vaccine. This is uh, the new um, the 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 investment in transmission reduction measure that been uh, 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 I mean been studied by um, uh, other part of the world, and also the. Um, the continue through analysis of antibody level, eh? um, track the progress and efficacy of the vaccine against the uh, variant of concern. Uh, this and other, uh, uh, we need to um, maybe um, the government uh, will, um, will post the policy of uh, we measure our uh, antibody level, especially uh, because uh, we don't know uh, uh, the uh, whether the vaccine. Um, uh, really work uh, for the coming uh, uh, variant of concern. Next, I think I think this is the, my 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 last slide. Um, next, um, next slide. I think uh, what is this? Uh, I did mention just now. I think uh, that's all that um, um, I would like to talk regarding the uh, uh, the pandemic to end the meet uh, in Malaysia. Back to you, uh, Prof. Zalia. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dato, for the uh, very concise and clear explanation on the uh, topic. Okay, so may I open the floor to the questions? If you have any questions, you can write in the chat box or maybe you can unmute and ask directly. Meantime, what, what I can point out a few points from Datuk Khalid just now, that endemic does not change the severity of the disease, yeah? especially for those who do not receive the vaccination. So we have to make sure that as much as, uh, as many as possible receive the vaccine. And then the viral pattern is hard to predict. So during the pandemic, we have noticed, yeah, there are a few variants and new variants have uh, appeared. And the law still applicable during the endemic. So in whatever way, we have to follow the uh, rules and regulation and the SOP that instructed uh, for us to do. Okay, to practice, prevent, yeah. Okay, uh, is there any question to Datuk Khaled? Assalamualaikum, Datu. Oh, okay, go ahead. Datu, I'm Sadia from Faculty Pharmacy. Datu, I have a very general questions uh, regarding this vaccine. Because nowadays, uh, Malaysia already started to give vaccine to 12 years until 17 years. Even my daughter, she is 12 plus, 12 years, 4 months. She also got her first dose. 
and uh, according to uh, i don't know this is true or not uh, the uh, but some, mostly uh, for the adults uh, we are recommended after our second dose especially we should be stay at home we don't go outside and the same is for the children as well so the duration period for uh, to be avoid to go in crowding after especially for the second dose is same for the children for the 12 years uh, in between 17 and for the adults the second thing is that because i also have children uh, below 12 at home so is there anything any uh, danger point for my other kids they are below 12 with the kids of uh, she is getting her vaccine and she is 12 plus especially after the second dose that, that thing. all right uh, thank you um, for your question um the first question is that the um usually the um the recommended from the manufacturer and also from the um, uh, the uh, team uh, specialist in, in MOH, after second dose, um, usually um, it will take 14 days. Uh, 14 days. Um, the same as for the uh, adolescent and, and, and adult, that uh, it's advisable to um, not to go into public places and to crowded area. And you still, um, if you, I mean, uh, if you need to go, then you must follow the SOP. Uh, the second issue that you did mention regarding your kids that um, below 12 years old, um, um, if you um, if you read the uh, dossier from um, various uh, manufacturer, actually the um, the uh, the vaccine uh, manufacturer uh, they do have the um, uh, study on the vaccine uh, to vaccinate the. Uh, three years and above, um, uh, three years and above. But uh, uh, in Malaysia, we not yet, um, I mean, uh, approve that. Um, so uh, we need uh, more data uh, to study um, from the um, various uh, uh, manufacturer, the, the Adoje. And um, since I, I think uh, shouldn't be any issue. Um, if you are talking, uh, you're taking the um, so-called the, uh, your, so-called your family um, consider, let's say, uh, 10 of you, then uh, at least uh, uh, eight of you are already uh, vaccinated, then you, you can you can say that, that, that already 80% in your bubble. That is uh, not another uh, another theory. But I think um, the most in, uh, important is that uh, um, you need to uh, really um, look into their their eating pattern, their, their, their sleep pattern, because um, this, the food, the sleep uh, will affect our, uh, our immunity. Okay, any more questions? Sorry, Tok. So, uh, I'm Marina from America. Um, I would like to ask you your opinion. Um, Singapore and Israel is one of the two countries that has got the highest uh, rate of vaccination in the world compared to the other country. And I think Malaysia is also reaching that way. But uh, we see uh, a recent surge of uh, cases in these two countries despite the high vaccination rate. So uh, does that mean that the, the vaccine are not so uh, effective? And uh, does that mean that everybody needs to have booster dose to curb the increased number of uh, surges of COVID cases? I mean, I do note as well that um, these numbers, yeah. even though there's increased number of cases, uh, the the severity of cases is, is lower lah compared to, I mean, there's a lot more asymptomatic patients plus those, uh, not those in category five lah. So what what do you think of that, uh, Dato? And um, I, was, I was also... Uh, um, reading about the 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 success in Uttar Pradesh uh, in India during the the surge of uh, COVID in India, and they did introduce um, what do you call that COVID kit that they 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 distribute because they don't have um, vaccines in India then uh, they don't have um, the vaccination program are not so uh, successful in India during that time like, during that that outbreak. 
um, and they, they, the, the medical uh, people, they actually went houses to houses and they distribute this home uh, COVID uh, kit test uh, comprising of a few very cheap medications uh, to affected people. Uh, what, what do you think of introducing that to a Malaysian population as well? Right, thank you um, uh, for the question. I think um, uh, in Israel, I think um, a few factors that we we, um, in, we have to take into consideration. Even though the the uh, um, the, uh, the vaccination rate is uh, very high, and then the uh, the cases also high. Um, the issue um, maybe uh, issue of various uh, a variant of concern. Uh, one, the other. Uh, uh, the second thing may be the too soon um, reopening of of the uh, uh, of the uh, economy um, in um, in Israel, and also the um, uh, we actually um, as I I did mention in my talk actually um, the issue of uh, my last line the issue of um, measuring the the the, uh, the antibody um, uh, um, in population. Uh, how fast is the the waning uh, uh, of the 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 antibody? Uh, so um, that's another uh, another issue that we have to look. Um, if you look um, into Korea practice, um, before we receive the the vaccine, they will measure the uh, our antibody first before uh, they giving us a, a vaccination. Uh, so um, that's a um, maybe a. a uh, as um, we all know, the, the the efficacy or the type of uh, vaccine also uh, uh, play uh, uh, a role uh, in this. Um, and then, uh, of course, the um, I did mention that um, the um, the three factors that we we must look into the uh, transmission, the host, the the environment, and the uh, the virus itself. These are three things that uh, I mean. Um, we have to look in 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 in, in Israel uh, before we come uh, uh, to uh, our conclusion. Um, um, the issue of uh, at uh, Uttar Pradesh, I think um, I totally agree with you. Um, um, right now, um, um, I think um, we should um, practice the um, uh, the FTTIS uh, way back. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, in uh, end of December, but uh, government didn't come out with the, what is the um, our uh, national uh, testing strategy for COVID. Um, um, it's good to um, uh, to hear that the uh, our new minister that uh, will uh, come out with the new uh, testing strategy for COVID. But it's better late than never, and. Um, when you're talking about this uh, kit uh, to the population, yes, uh, uh, it's good. That's why the uh, the um, state uh, of Slango uh, are giving uh, this kit to the um, uh, B40. We are giving the uh, uh, saliva test kit. We are giving the uh, 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 um, the um, vitamin C and uh, a few of uh, um, others that can um, uh, can help the uh, population. Thank, thank you yeah. for the question. Okay, any more? We have still have uh, another few minutes. I have a question. Can I? Can I yes, it? yes. Okay, that uh, Prof Vilaya. Prof, you would like to ask? Can you comment? On what of the atomic Not very clear, Prof. I, I can I can hear. Yeah, we can't hear you. Now, do you do you comment on the mechanical Yeah, we are having difficulty. Prof, can you can you write in the chat box your questions? Because we can't we can't get your words. Is it like a lagging, right? Oh. 
we 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 can't hear you bro Maybe we can answer later um, after the second speaker. Yeah, yeah, uh, maybe after. If uh, Prof can uh, uh, write in, in uh, our chat box. Yeah. Uh, any more question from others? If not, we proceed to the uh, second speaker. And then maybe at the end of the uh, talk of second speaker, then maybe if somebody have uh, another question to that, too, also can, right, Rato? Yes, yes, no problem. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dato, for your kind, uh, um, I mean, kind words in answering all the questions. <laughs> okay, whatever happened, we must move on, yeah, from living with the strict measures and live together with the COVID-19. So the big challenge to face is the workplace because we have to hang out with many people while at work. So let us listen to our second speaker, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Siti Munirayasin on the challenges and workplace strategies for the COVID-19 pandemic era. Associate Professor Dr. Siti Munira is a public health medicine specialist majoring in occupational health, and she is currently head of the Center for the Occupational Safety, Health and Wellbeing, and also the lecturer at uh, my department, Department of Public Health Medicine. She uh, graduated with the Master's of Public Health, MPH, and also a Doctor of Public Health and concentrating on the area uh, her work more con uh, concentrating on the area of occupational health safety from um uh from from the various uh involvement right uh her interest and involvement are more in the um, workplace health promotion smoking initiative and also smoking cessation. She also conducted and initiated various local and national level workshops in many private and government agencies in the area of ergonomic occupational stress, occupational infection, health risk assessment, chemical health risk assessment, and, and many others. Okay, uh, Prof. Associate Professor Dr. Munira, your floor, uh, the floor is yours. Are you ready? Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi okay, wabarakatuh. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Associate Professor uh, Dr. Zaliha Ismail for the very kind introduction. And um, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to professors, Associate Professors, Doctors, uh, uh, and uh, respected guest speakers and also all uh, guests for this uh, webinar session. Okay, uh, so um, I'm going to have about 30 minutes to talk about challenges and workplace strategies for COVID-19 uh, endemic era. Okay, so um, what um, I'm going to do this uh, for this session is I'm going to talk a little bit about some definitions that we have uh, for um, why is occupational safety and health is important uh, for workplace. Okay, uh, especially when we talk about workplace organization of uh, COVID-19 and any other uh, infectious diseases. Then we look, uh, we're going to look a little bit, I'm just going to explain a little bit about the law that governs COVID-19 in the workplace. Some challenges faced by workplaces and share my experience, workplace experiences uh, that currently uh, we are conducting research uh, uh, in the workplace. And also um, some strategies for prevention uh, for future infectious disease at the workplace. Okay, so what is occupational safety and health? Maybe all some of you are not yet aware that whereby in any particular company, regardless if it's in um, university settings or private industries, um, government industry, government uh, organizations, uh, we have a law that we uh, are bound to. Okay, so occupational safety and health, or what we call it occupational health and safety. Nowadays, previously it was used. We used to call it occupational safety and health. But in overseas, you will look into the aspect whereby health is always above safety because safety is already a well, very well established area. And occupational health is actually also a very important area. So this relates to health, safety, and welfare issues of in the workplace, uh, not just for the employers, but we're also looking for employees and also any visitors and also uh, any um, contractors who comes to that particular place. Okay, so OHS includes laws, we're talking about laws, we're talking about standards, uh, we're talking about programs that are aimed at making the workplace a better place for workers, 
along with their co-workers, family members, customers, and stakeholders. So when we talk about occupational health, we also deal with all aspects of safety and health in the workplace. And it has to have a very, very strong focus on primary prevention of hazards. So at the workplace, we have five different types of hazards, with, uh, whereby uh, one of the hazards uh, is biological hazards, which relates to occupational infections. Okay, so at the end of the day, what we're trying to fulfill or trying to ensure an end of the place is um, having workers who are, who are healthy and, and promotes healthy well-being of the workers, whereby we're looking into good work environment. We're also looking to financial security for the environment. We're looking also into work-life balance of the workers. And as, as of course, fulfillment of work and increasing productivity, and also looking into interpersonal relationship with workers and mental and physical well-being. So if any particular company, whether it's in Malaysia or overseas, when we talk about OSH, it's something we're looking about productivity, we're talking about good business, we're talking about better brand image and also higher employee morale. So one of the uh, things that we're uh, going to concentrate today is with regards to occupational infections. Okay, so laws are governed by uh, occupational uh, infectious disease in Malaysia. So we have our Prevention of Control of Infectious Disease Act 1988 and Regulations uh, Act 342, which I would think was well, well explained by uh, Dato just uh, Dato Khalid just now. And then now we have OSHA law, and we have also other laws uh, related to workplaces. So OSHA, OSHA uh, is Occupational Safety and Health Law 1994, gazetted 1994 ensures that employers are the main player in any particular organization, whereby employers must provide their employees with a workplace that does not have serious hazards and must follow all OSHA safety and health standards. So we have this law whereby if employers do not comply, they get fined. Okay, we also have laws whereby employees do not comply with what employers uh, 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 ask you to do, you also get fined or uh, will be uh, is under a, a, a law and regulations. Okay, So it, one part of the things that um, under OSHA's law also looks into training and providing dissemination information protection of workers' health and safety, a good record keeping for the organization and illnesses, which includes performing appropriate testing for workers and monitoring in the workplace, PPE protection, notification of cases. So these are the things is governed, governed by law, which needs to be complied in any organization, including UITM. Okay, so we look also into government uh, on top of these two laws, basically the law for infectious disease uh, that uh, is actually overruling the law for, uh, for in terms of infectious disease. Okay, so however, when it comes to workplace, another law, which is OSHA 94, also takes to place. Okay, and we also on top of the laws, we also have current government updated policies, which obviously receive some of these uh, policies and guides from various ministries, from Ministry of Health, uh, from um, from from various other, like from KSM, from KPTs and so on, okay? So um, these are the current updated policies by time, okay? Then we have our own, each particular organization have their own policy and guidelines. So we must comply to all this to ensure that our place, our place is uh, healthy and safe for all. Okay, however, what's, what's happening in the current world, okay? It used to be OSHA, it's a very, very uh, complete law. However, what happens in the COVID-19 is something which is a little bit saddened, whereby people has looked into the issue whereby a government or workers or employers are not being able to ensure that uh, the workplaces are totally 100% safe, safe for health, healthy for all. So government has been thinking and looking into this issue very lightly, not just in Malaysia, but also overseas. He say that OSHA does not currently have the tools needed to address workplace-related risk in terms of exposures and infections for SARS-CoV-2. OSHA cannot make workplaces safe, whereby it's actually the responsibility of employers. We have lots of cases. We have many cases whereby workplace clusters are emerging or has emerged before, and that's causing a very great toll or death, death toll in, uh, in Malaysia, and also not just in Malaysia, also in, uh, internationally. Okay, so by law, every worker has the right to a safe workplace as OSHA's law uh, permits. And OSHA's law is actually to protect the rights of the um, ensure that employees eliminate, in, el employees eliminate all possible hazards, which includes biological hazards that could injure workers. 
and also cause infections to workers and also increase the risk of illnesses. So what happened along the way? There are many, um, um, uh, many um, initiatives have been done, which includes one being done by, uh, by SOXO, okay, uh, Malaysia, so, and also, uh, so all the occupational physicians and specialists in the area, and also with DOSH and also with safety, uh, uh, with those involved in safeties, we come with a conclusion whereby Malaysia needs to designate. COVID-19 as occupational disease. So once you have the disease occupational disease, what happened in the fifth schedule of the Employment Social Security Act 1969, these workers who are actually contacted COVID-19 at the workplace it becomes a, a, a disease that where they can get compensation. Okay, similarly, employees who are infected due to the exposing exposures arising out of and in course of the employment will be covered under this employment injury scheme. So they get they get compensated, all right? They get um, from SOXO and also from supposedly from Estonia as well, government servants. Okay, and then from there, those who uh, and they get their bills or uh, gets to be covered by the SOXO. And also currently SOXO is also providing uh, those insured workers, insured workers by them or organization insured by SOXO, they're providing free kits for all these companies. Uh, free uh, test kits uh, for uh, COVID-19. Okay, so what are we, when we talk about um, workplaces, we want to ensure that our workplace is totally safe and healthy. So what are the things that we normally do in any particular place? We look by the best methods or hierarchy when we want to ensure prevention. So this looks into primary prevention, whereby primary prevention is we do something even before it occurs or along the way when it occurs, we're trying to prevent it from progressing further. Okay, so in any particular workplace, the first thing we would do is assess the risk first. How severe is the case? The severity of the case, I think most of us in uh, UITM also in any particular companies, they did this, they did this risk assessment initially, and even with COVID-19, who is supposed to be, who's exposed, and who is at high risk, who at low risk, we have a list of uh, workers or staff who, has, who, have, who are at high risk, who are at low risk, who should be put in frontliners, who cannot be put in frontliners. And when it comes, it comes to when we get any sorts of infections, we're supposed to try to eliminate those sort of hazards or occupational hazards in terms, we go by elimination, substitution, injury control, administrative control, and also PPEs. So PPEs, if you notice, PPEs that we are using right now, the um, um, the three-ply mask, okay, maybe N95, is actually the last resort. It's always the last resort in any, any particular hazards, including infectious disease hazards. Because why? Because we know that people will not comply to it. Okay, so it's not the first the first thing we do. We always go by substitution. We cannot do in this case. We cannot do elimination. We always go by doing control, ensuring that, and also at least control. So you control in these two matters. In doing control, ensuring the ventilation is good and reduces transmission of infections, as well as we go by administer control, whereby we control people who comes into our organization and who comes out. So eliminating this hierarchy, using this hierarchy of control is the most effective in any particular workplace. And has been used for in so many hazards, and it's been using, it's been using right, it has been used, it's still being used right now in uh, industries with I will explain to you after this. Okay, so end of the day, when we talk about prevention, it's always about culture change. We can't force people to wear PPE, we can't force people to use administrative control, telling them to come to the office and doing this all, and, and telling them not to uh, to go to certain locations or overcrowding. We can't tell people. And we can't tell people to do that unless we have a very good cultural change or cul prevent culture prevention. Okay, so um, so before I go on to the preventive aspects uh, that we should be concentrating on, Okay, um, I'm just going to explain to you what actually we are doing right now uh, in terms of learning experiences. Okay, so this is, um, we've been getting mandated by uh, DOSH uh, to do a very uh, important project for the nation. Uh, for, with, uh, so myself with, with Faculty of Medicine and also Kosho, we have some faculties involved, also Professor Les involved in this project and Dr. Khalid as well. Uh, we uh, are trying at the process of developing guidelines. So DOSH does not have the guidelines at present. What you see, the guidelines available is currently from basically from Ministry of Health. 
people have been asking all around where is DOSH guideline? Where how should we implement in industries? We have seven or nine to ten industry industrial categories. So whereby ed education is just one of the category. There's no guideline yet. So now we have been given mandated to prepare a guideline uh, for um, infectious disease um, uh, in the industries. Okay, so this particular guideline where we're given money to is actually going to be used uh, for whole, all industries in Malaysia. A very, um, it's a general, that specific one for, um, for and which can be used in all industries. Okay, so of course, scope this project, which I'm going to explain a little bit, uh, sharing a little bit what we've uh, gotten, uh, where, where we have actually um, gone into or currently doing. Okay, so this project started uh, in October. In, in August, and it's supposed to end in um, July, whereby we're supposed to come with the guideline available uh, for to be used in Malaysia. Okay, so uh, the, the, there are four parts to this project. So part one, we, we, co we conduct project A and B. Two, after we have conducted part project A and B, we're going to develop the guideline with the expertise, and then we, we're going to disseminate uh, an information sharing. Even uh, this weekend, I'm going to have, I'm going to share some um, some content of the project, um, the initial parts to uh, all uh, OHTs in Malaysia as well as SHOs. Okay, and then uh, we're gonna, and then the day we're gonna develop some uh, promotional materials from this project. Okay, so this is uh, the the outcome of this uh, project or the main uh, use of this project. We're gonna have some quantitative survey. Uh, we whereby we're going to collect about forty to eighty companies. Uh, so it's 40 to 60 companies uh, we're going to survey this is in the process of actually uh, just uh, we are just piloting it in UITM the first uh, very small pilot and then we're going to distribute it uh, to about 60 based on seven different industries in Malaysia okay then uh, we are currently doing a systematic review as well two systematic reviews looking into current laws and regulations uh, which is suitable for Malaysia and another one looking at the health impacts of um, COVID-19 to Malaysia and also from overseas. Okay, so next is uh, we're doing a currently a qualitative interview and also we are doing an on-site case studies for this project. So after we have developed a part one of the project, which is supposed to be completed sometime in uh, December, we are going to the second part, which by we are calling all the subject matter experts uh, uh, for this area. Okay, and come and looking into the results of this project, and we're going to do some roundtable discussions with experts, and also we're going then from there we're going to develop our, our guideline with these experts, inshallah. So what I'm to, going to share with you today some um, some findings, okay, that we did on uh, from our online uh, focal group discussions. Okay, so we had on we are supposed to have like three to ten uh, companies, so we have identified. Uh, about six or seven companies already will be part of the of the uh, qualitative study, which is section B1. Okay, so uh, for the first one, university, we have chosen university, which is our own university, to be uh, respondents for this qualitative sort of interview. Okay, next one, we have already um, interviewed a multinational manufacturing company, and we have also interviewed a national service company. Okay, so this is just some of the pictures that we did. We tend to be two groups. So the first picture is actually us with uh, Muhammad, uh, with uh, Tuan Haji Anwar, Deputy DG for uh, for DOSH, who's actually looking, really uh, asking all his uh, work uh, staff to actually assist us with this project because it's going to be a very important uh, guideline which is going to be produced. Okay, and then we have some people here from uh, various industries. Okay, some from UITM and also from others, other industries. And we have our our Paka here who's interviewing this um uh these um companies. Okay, looking we interview two groups, the workers as well as the perspective of the workers as well as perspective from the employer side. Okay, so I'm just going to share with you some of the results that we obtained, um, which is just a uh, very fresh from the oven. Okay, so this one is actually a uh, very, very, um, uh, it's just uh, still very, very new. We have not yet released these results, but we're just going to show some of the things that we found out uh, throughout this um, um, project uh, for the second, for the part on the qualitative interviews. So human factors. Most of the we talk about company A, B, and C. I'm going to tell. I'm not going to tell you which is company A, which is company B is, and which is company C. Which is very confidential. Okay, but in terms of human factors, we're looking into most of the workers here has no issues with regards to visitors. Uh, most of the uh, so managers claim that there's no issues with regards to uh, man, uh, more visitors that you have with regards to contractors. Initially, they were thinking there was some resistance that we have. 
okay, people do not really comply in the initial phase, but then once there are many more, when we have received, uh, once uh, the government has imposed uh, many guidelines and uh, so on, uh, and also the industry themselves has started to uh, to realize the importance of um, prevention of COVID-19, um, the acceptance is really good in the companies. Okay, but however, there is some disagreement on my staff in terms of issues of work adjustments. There are some companies who actually are not happy with the work adjustments that they have. Okay, um, uh, and the workers are not happy, and workers complain to the management. And um, but um, but but no direct objection was given by the organizations. Okay, so good OSH team, company B and C has a very good OSH team. Any issues with regard to COVID nineteen was brought forward to the OSH committee. Okay, which is very, very good, excellent, which is what was recommended in not in Malaysia, also internationally. Okay. However, we have problem with lack of awareness. Still existed some individuals, especially related to health issues. Okay, we have a they have a good OSH team with HSO safety health officers existed in the companies to ensure all is taken care of. Okay. They also receive good feedback received by SHOs in the two organizations and safety and health committee existed in every unit of the department. And people who are in the safety health committee, at least they have a safety health officers, they have maybe OHTs or PACAS, or also they maybe have an OSH coordinators. Okay, next we talk about compliance. Uh, one company, company A, was talking about ventilation system. The other two companies did not mention at all about ventilation system, but this company mentioned that ventilation system in that particular industry was not suitable, okay, whereby certain locations were not well disseminated. Okay, sharing of ventilation caused a big issue to the, to the workers. Okay, aircon filter was, and split units were not clean as scheduled, and some locations are higher risk than others, which is not being looked into. Okay, next we looked into the, uh, the uh, psychosocial issues. Okay, so psychosocial issues, productivity of workers um, was mentioned by company A and company B and also company C, basically. Issues among workers had increased. They mentioned that lots of cases they have among anxiety and depression. Lots of cases we referred to the clinic with regards to anxiety and depression among workers. Okay, so they're also misinterpreted of current situation. Okay, so anxiety is because of workers. Work anxiety among staff who comes to work. Okay. Some workers, when they notice that uh, there are positive cases in their particular place, they are afraid to come to work. So it becomes anxiety to them. Okay, so this is this is the patient they do receive and um, company B. Okay, and also some productivity issues was observed among workers in company B, especially workers who are who are supposed to be on the field uh, but actually working not working in the field. Okay, that not not everyone should be working, uh, work from home. Okay, so some workers, uh, they they take um, some companies. What they did was, uh, they had some um some sort of work adjustment, and then to ensure that productivity continues. Okay, then um, increase and and we has in, enhanced and diversity of work is very good. Any issues discussed in detail with the facilities in the company will come to B. And the issue they, they, the, uh, the company A and company B has is technical staff who are not aware of the most infection and the updates knowledge. Okay, knowledge is not being updated. Most infection was not and was also unclear among the technical technical staff. Okay, new to contracts, especially companies which have contracts with outside. Okay, they have got, they have people who does uh, who manage the waste. They have people who manage uh, certain aspects of of the organization. Oh, uh, 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 new contracts needs to be all contracts needs to be discontinued and new contracts needs to be given to ensure that they comply to the COVID nineteen situation. Okay, also what was being complained by these workers in company A is with regards to poor reward, poor reward from the, uh, from the, um, uh, from the organization, with regards to overtime of staff who works extra hours, especially during COVID nineteen, which reduces the morale of the workers. And this one particular uh, company, which has a very, very good system, ISO 45001-2018, which was recommended. According to that company, um, the ISO 45001-2018 plays a very, very important role uh, in ensuring continuous process of improvement. Okay, good record keeping was done. They even have, um, this particular company even has people who are unvaccinated and they have reasons for unvaccination. They have complaint boards everywhere inside the, the organization, whereby anyone who complains about anything will be taken into account within a few days time. And they have WhatsApp group whereby people can just complain using the WhatsApp group. Okay, so prevention is ultimate. 
because of this very, very important ISO 45001 system, whereby it is actually under OSH system. It ensures the plant and operation is working very well. Company A also has not, uh, but company A and company B, company B, company B is actually, company C has a very good ISO 45000 system, company B is going towards that, company A has nothing of that sort. Okay, then we have um, 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 another part of referral to guidelines. Most of the guidelines are being, they took were from, from uh, Ministry of Health, from CPRC, from WHO, from our DOSH even, and some are from local companies. We had no issue with that. They were happy. Uh, some managers were, but Alhamdulillah, some managers or some companies were even going further than that. Okay, they are going into evidence-based journals for their policies. Okay, which is very, uh, which, uh, which I was talking to the West Company, they even had their own guideline, their guidelines being shared with Ministry of Health. Ministry of Health took their guidelines, okay, as, uh, as their guideline for that particular type of industry, all right? So some um, even refer to similar operation overseas. They have a policy, they follow based on the general government, they, they, but they have their own sub type of policies which are very specific, not, uh, and more detailed, uh, not just based on what is being give, given by the government. Okay, then we have uh, dissemination of information was officially done by some companies. Okay, any positive cases inform and caution. Okay, dissemination information is very, very important uh, when you talk about um, um, controlling infectious disease. Okay, ideal situation when there's positive case, the workers need to be informed. Okay, and contact tracing needs to be done. So this particular company B and company C has a, has a very good um, complain open and good communication with the employer employee all right the means of communication basically by all companies which to email whatsapp group which is whatsapp seems to be the most effective and all okay visitors to sites informed of policy all visitors to sites will be informed at the door gates in company b and company c of what are the the policies of the organization in terms of covid19 however in terms of awareness program of infectious disease still lacking in company A, company B, and also company C, they do not get latest information as required as soon as possible by all the uh, uh, managers. Okay, training is lacking to some of the companies. They only had more than two box prior to start work. The SOPs need to be informed to our contractors visiting and um, and um, awaiting programs. Some of them are just awaiting from programs from Ministry of Health to give some sort of information to them regarding uh, uh, infectious diseases and some companies that are way way behind okay so um just a little bit more on the challenges for employees okay so uh we we conducted actually the interviews both employees and employees so employees have their own groups uh we contacted so this is three groups uh we have so far correct three groups of employers and three groups for employees so so this is the results for employees dissemination in terms of dissemination information the employees, they only want to infographics. <laughs> okay, they only want to infographics to them. They do not want to read anything worthy or lengthy. Okay, they just want infographics because for them it's difficult to understand uh, if it's uh, in terms of words. They just want pictures. They want um, uh, posters. Okay, and they would like videos, lots of videos uh, in terms of dissemination of information. Working from home, some uh, industries, company B says it's more productive for some type of job and can, can cut electricity bills for the companies, okay? But commitment and motivation is essential according to them, whereby when you're given more flexible hours, you need to have be more committed, okay? And however, some also claim management is, do not believe in this uh, sort of work from home um, uh, um, issue, okay? So they have been complaining to during the meeting. Okay, online system is unstable and confusing from com company B. I think also we have similar issues in uh, company A and C also. Okay, awareness program on COVID-19 uh, needs to be enhanced, okay, and dissemination information is essential, fastest through WhatsApp, they always say fastest through WhatsApp, official through email, WhatsApp first, then run the email, okay, so the head uh, or leader at a place is an example to others, this, uh, this is a very um, good, um, good complaint by the employees, they said, the head of the organization is an example to all, so if you uh, as a leader, regardless if you are head of department, head of unit, small unit of you, uh, even up to the top management, the workers always look at you as an example. Okay, so first step must be taken by the employer, uh, by the head first, then we'll be followed by the, the other workers. 
Okay, so facilities for for work from home provided for staff. Okay, so company B and C has a very good policy when and by the when they wanted they implemented work from home uh, work from home policy. They have their own policy for from home. They provided staff with money, two hundred ringgit or something, some incentive for them to buy equipment for uh maybe some sort of incentive for them, and then some were provided with laptops. Okay, and then they were provided with guidelines on how to ensure that the workplace is good, uh, in terms of ergonomics and so on. Okay, so PPEs, a, a company B and C provide all PPEs for all their staff, including um those who work from home. Okay, and physical distancing for company B, they mentioned that it's quite difficult because they have open space, so especially in workstations because of the nature of work. So, physical distancing was an issue uh, uh, with some of the companies. Okay, so how um, after looking into this um, uh, issues, okay, which uh, actually um, uh, in order for us to produce a guideline, we have to uh, call in the experts in. Okay, and and present all our data in terms of um our uh, quantitative into survey, which is uh, quite a lengthy one. Okay, so this can be distributed about two thousand five hundred workers throughout Malaysia. Okay, and then the qualitative interview about eight companies, and then we uh, we have our systematic review as well in place, and then also our building assessment. Okay, so building assessments and then the issue whereby we look into ventilation. We look also into indoor air quality and also building structure. That's uh, that's part of our project that we have as well to complement um, on how to prevent this uh, future workplace infections. However, because of this uh, seminar, I'm just going to explain to you what others have been doing, okay, and what is current uh, recommended guideline for from WHO, from ILO, and so on, right? So preventing future infections, as we know from our qualitative interview. From our knowledge, our background knowledge, and my area in occupational safety and health prevention. In order to ensure good prevention, we must have a good prevention policy. All right, prevention is easy. It's a lot easier, okay, as compared to curing those who already have positive cases and COVID nineteen and those who are infected. Okay, uh, it's the cost is a lot lesser. Okay, we're talking about costs lesser. We're talking about producing healthy life for our workers. We're talking also about happy, happy family life. Okay, because uh, in OSH, when we want to do, when we want to ensure well-being of individuals, we must look at the individual as a whole, not just individual in terms of working life. We almost look, we always have to think of how they will they conduct their uh, good family life as well, because um, productive workers come from a, a product or happy family, right? So cure. It's very complex, expensive, okay, time-consuming, and it causes lots of stress to the family, and definitely will cause reduced productivity of the organization. And maybe in YTM we're not talking so much of productivity, but ever when you talk about industry, they are talking, they are counting monies and days, okay, they are counting monies, how many days they lost, uh, days and work days lost, okay. But for us, we are looking about our Outcome, which is our productivity in terms of our TNL, in terms of our research, in terms of our um, services. Okay, so according to um, when we look into the prevention mitigation at work, so we did a uh, part of our systematic review. We do look into various um, guidelines. Okay, guidelines uh, which is suitable. So one of them is uh, we look into intervention labor organization, whereby they look into prevention of COVID nineteen at work. And there's a checklist for it. You can actually basically you can just uh, get it from the internet. It's very easy. You can just but you have to look through all what is important. So when we talk about prevention, we must always look into the work itself, okay, the work or workforce that people we are uh, we are dealing with, and also the workplace. We must ensure that all these three components is being taken care of. We do not just look into the workforce. Workplace is very very important as well. We must ensure good ventilation, properly fitted place, uh, good workspaces. The place is healthy and safe for all. All right, and in terms of work, workplace, work organization is very very important. Okay, so this is just uh, some uh, basic um, uh, we would call uh, sort of like a checklist. Okay, you can get this from the intern. I'm not going to go through it. Okay, you can um, uh, later, hopefully, when we get our guideline done, we will have something like this for Malaysia situation, which is more suitable for our local population. All right, respond, recover, and thrive. All right. So uh, employers, I'm just um, before this uh, last few minutes, I'm just going to explain what um, 
uh, what should be planned for by employers. Okay, first of all, employers because in OSHA employees is, employers play a very very important role. So when I talk about employers here, we do not just mean the VC. It goes down towards until the head of unit, or head of department, and lower down even head of um, whoever has a bit uh, a particular small um, uh, section himself or herself. Okay, so what needs to be done? Areas to plan for, assess the risk of pandemic, how you will maintain your essential services or activities. You must think of in long absence of workers and coming back workers, how you will maintain this activity, how this continuous process is going to occur. Okay, the essential goods and services you rely and how you can implement alternate work practices. For example, social distancing, remote working. I think most of us in UITM have been doing this, then has done a very good job in, uh, in putting this into place. But we must ensure whatever we get from Ministry of Health or guidelines, it must, it must fit to our local population, to our local uh, company, our local organization, uh, and also according to our product TBT that we are trying to, to, uh, to produce. Okay, so plans to assume the following space capacity, childcare or transportation system, Adults have opportunity to be vaccinated. Vaccination is a must nowadays. We must ensure our workers are all vaccinated in order to come to office. Okay, uh, face covering must be provided for free of charge to the workers. Enhanced cleaning protocols will be in place. Okay, we must ensure all these things are are in place. All right, accommodations for high risk individuals um, needs to be uh, available in. Not maybe in, not your ITM, but maybe other industries. Okay, so plans to prioritize includes essential operations, instruction, instructional support services. We must ensure our support services are complied to our uh, policies that we have. Okay, uh, student support services, employee support services, services provided. So the policy must go across the board in terms of COVID nineteen policy must go across the board regardless of wherever units you are working at. Okay, so um, workers are absent due to COVID-19, copy taking care of relative or I'm going out of time, so I'll just go very quickly. Okay, so coping with high rate of septicism, this is another issue, absenteeism and presentism. Absenteeism in itself is um, not be being away from work. For us, presentism, you are at work, but however, you are in your mind is elsewhere or you're not really concentrating at work, you may be sleeping at work, that is presentism. So this issue of absenteeism and presentism has been discussed in quite lengthy in detail in the literatures and also in companies how to adopt from research into practice and what how, what should we, we do okay so these are some of the things that i i put in uh from this uh, literatures that i've uh, searched and also from the practices okay uh, adapting work to cope with reduced workforce cross train workers to perform essential functions and relying on interim stuff all right so this was so post some post pandemic also um uh, whereby you need to conduct uh additional risk assessment, plan for to resume work, and adaptations to lay out of the workforce. Ensure that it's reduced COVID-19 transmission. And if you have a occupy health services, which most of the industries have, do contact them, ask for advice and so on on what to do. Okay, stay special attention to workers who are at high risk. Putting in place support for workers who may be suffering from anxiety and stress is very essential. Okay, workers might uh, be worried about increased chance of infection and may not want to return to work. Okay, uh, so very basic rule involve your workers participate in workers as rules no point if you do a policy a very good policy but you cannot get your workers to comply to this policy make sure they can comply to the policy make sure they give good feedback to you this is part of good iso 45001 consider also to ensure the agency workers and contractors access to the same information so your contractors are part of your organization, even though they they be hired by somebody else, but you pay them to do something in your in your in your premise, you must ensure that they comply to your rules. Okay, so taking care of workers post pandemic, we can, I I'm not going to go through this, but we do have issues with regard to post pandemic people who's returning because of COVID nineteen, they have uh, been previously been infected, they may be, they have developed some symptoms which you may look, look into, especially workers. Um, uh, they may have some anxiety, depression, or maybe some of them even have long-term disability or illnesses that they may have to defer, they may, we may have to cater to their needs, all right? Okay, so these are some of the issues uh, explained uh, as well. So I think that has, has covered this one issue, workplace are ready for future communicable disease. Uh, this inshallah will be in our guidelines soon. Okay, okay, plan for the future, all the vaccination, any pandemic preventive measure is essential. We need to prepare our checklist, okay, enterprise that have used cellular 
tell you working for the first time may consider adopting it as a modern long-term working practices okay possible possibility of pos a possibility of developing tele networking policy and procedures may need to be done especially when many of us are working from home and possibly this may may continue for the next one year or maybe it's the best method um work home and so or also work in office um, as an alternative because if it if it does not if it increases productivity there's no harm right Okay, so I'm not going, okay, so this is just um, the last one, okay. So this is telling you, I think last, last time what we did, we used to um, have uh, many um, uh, Twitters and internet and using, uh, ask our students to do teleworking, but now early pandemic, we work from home, all right? But at the end of the day, uh, amazingly, uh, some research has shown that working from home is a lot better, or maybe it's produce some sort of better um, um, productivity for the, for the staff, especially those who can do their work anywhere. Okay, so we have provided a very nice uh, place at, at home to do our work, and now we are shifting back to the office. Uh, hopefully, we can start doing hybrid, inshallah. Okay, I think that's all. Um, I do have some more slides, but I think that's, um, they can just be uh, ignored because there's nothing much in there. So just a uh, last one here. There is um, from a guideline from working from home, okay, whereby there are various studies looking into this issue, uh, whether it can be implemented in organizations. But of course, we need to look also after that into mental illnesses, issues with musculoskeletal disorders, quality of life, and absenteeism and presenteeism as a whole. All right, so thank you. So this is my team. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, as I said, Professor Dr. Siti Munira, for the extensive uh talks on the uh topic okay um as uh, you all have seen that just now right the osha 1994 occupational safety and health act 1994 said that employers must provide their employees with the workplace that does not have serious hazard so how to identify the hazard we have to do what we call it the high rack or the risk assessment uh, we call it a uh, hazard identification risk assessment and risk control so this uh, should be done at any organization right so we have to identify the hazard and what are the risks to our workers okay um can we have a question from the floor from the audience is there any questions to associate Professor Munira first? Then we go back to the Datuk Khalid because we have a question in the chat box to Datuk Khalid. No? That's very clear, right? <laughs> so many challenges that uh, don't know which one to ask. Okay, meantime, can can uh, can I have uh, Dato um, for this question, Dato? Uh, my question to Dato Khale from Prof. Vilayan is the clinical trials with the use of Ivermectin result out from the, what, eight government hospitals? Okay, and then the second one is, do you think a third dose of the vaccine is necessary to the senior citizen above 60 years old? You said about the annual vaccination. Please elaborate more. Dato Khaled, are you still right. with us? Yeah. Hey, thank you, Prof. Um, uh, thank you, Prof. Lyon, for your question uh, regarding the uh, the study uh, done by um, each um, Ministry um, of Health Hospital regarding ivermectin. To my knowledge, the um, the report not yet out, but um, as um, uh, we know that the government already uh, gave the permission for the off-label use for the ivermectin. So uh, I think uh, with that, uh, that's a, a, a choice um, for the um, for the population whether uh, you want to use uh, or not. I mean, uh, the, the the outcome of the study um, um, we have to look into um, because um, most of uh, in the hospital uh, they need the um, uh, the uh, no, I mean the uh, approval from the patient whether they uh, they like to uh, to be to be uh, one of the uh, candidate uh, to try with ivermectin, and also we must um, uh, remember that when we do the study of ivermectin, we must uh, look into um, uh, various category of uh, a patient from uh, uh, cat one to cat five. 
so this is another uh, another issue of uh, I mean getting the 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 uh, correct data and also the so-called control group um, those who not uh, yet uh, been uh, um, impacted by uh, COVID-19. Um, uh, regarding the third dose, uh, I mean, um, actually, um, um, I think we must remember the, the issue of um, the, the terms of third dose and booster dose. Actually, uh, um, when we're talking about third dose and booster dose, um, they uh, define it uh, 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 differently. The booster dose uh, mean that uh, we give to this um, so-called the high-risk group. Uh, um, study done that shows that um, the vanity of the antibody level for the senior citizen, those who more than 60 and those with comorbid uh, is higher compared to the uh, without comorbid and, uh, and normal population. That's why uh, the, we are suggesting to give to those who are um, more than 60 uh, and also those who are more than 60 with or without comorbid. And the other one that boosted those also we are giving to the uh, um, medical frontliner because uh, uh, we don't know the, um, the um, issue of uh, BOC, uh, a variant of concern. And uh, this is uh, um, just to, to protect uh, our uh, medical frontliner. The third dose is that for the healthy, I mean, population, um, this will be uh, uh, an, an optional, uh, an optional. Uh, but uh, um, as I mentioned in my talk uh, uh, just now, um, um, a few of uh, other country um, make a practice that um, uh, they measure the the antibody level, eh? uh, the natural and an, uh, antibody level uh, in that population before proceed with the uh, dose, um, because uh, uh, the response of a vaccine uh, from one individual to another another individual is uh, is is quite uh, uh, different. So uh, uh, maybe uh, um, you got the higher antibody um, with low uh, vanity, uh, maybe the other person, uh, uh, um, I mean, the vanity is, uh, is quite, quite fast. So um, to me, uh, the third, um, if you ask me uh, personal, my, my personal uh, answer is that for the booster dose, yes, uh, um, I would like to make a compulsory. For the third dose is um, um, depend on the um, the risk uh, um, uh, factor that you uh, you do have the risk of your work the risk of uh, uh, your your health and the risk of the uh, 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 um, area that you you see um, example um, uh, urban uh, uh, very uh, populated area so these are a few uh, things that uh, we uh, uh, we must consider that's why i say that um, we must go back to the three factors that host the environment and also the uh, the virus factor also uh, will be applicable in in uh, deciding whether you want to take the third dose or not uh, the issue of the um, annual vaccination that is my my prediction uh, that that because uh, um, even though that's not uh, uh, my prediction but you must remember the uh, pandemic phase to endemic phase is a uh, different between one country to another country. Maybe uh, we can declare uh, our endemic, but in, in, in other country is pandemic or epidemic. So um, uh, they might, they might uh, put a, a, a ruling that to get a visa, you must get the, uh, uh, the, the vaccine. So these uh, uh, international travelers also, uh, uh, um, I mean, um, become um, uh, the 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 um, vaccination be, become a gatekeeper. So uh, maybe uh, in in future, um, maybe in five um, in um, five years uh, um, in future, uh, maybe we have to take an uh, annual uh, vaccination. That is my my prediction. Thank you, Bob. Okay, thank you, Dato. Uh, is there any more question? No. Well, 
we have we have quite a number of participants here. We have 113 participants. If uh, there is no question, I think uh, we shall close our uh, session. Um, again, thank you very much to all the speakers, Datuk Khaled and also Associate Professor uh, Siti Munira. Okay, with that, okay, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Yeah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Yang Bahagia Datuk Dr. Khalid Ibrahim, Associate Professor Dr. Siti Munira Yassin, and also our moderator, Associate Professor Dr. Zalihal, for a very insightful session. All the best, and we look forward to your guidelines soon, inshallah. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now pause for a short five-minute break. Please uh, come back and join us for session two um, in... Five minutes, yeah, ten thirty-two, and um, hopefully we can stretch ourselves and maybe get another cup of coffee. See you then. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> welcome back to the Know Your Endemic, Know Your Response webinar brought to you by the Office of Deputy Vice Chancellor, Research and Innovation, University Technology Mara. We will now move on to the second session, which will be moderated by our very own Professor Dr. Tay Lei Kik. Professor Dr. Tay is the Deputy Director of the Integrative Pharmacogenomics Institute of UITM, or better known as iPromise. Please welcome Prof. Professor Dr. Tay Lei Kik. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Umi, for introducing me and uh, welcome back all the participants for a second session. Um, yeah, we had a very exciting talk uh, this morning from very, uh, two very good uh, speakers just now, and we have uh, learned a lot of things with regards to uh, the transformation from pandemic to epidemic and endemic, right? So I think a lot of us know uh, and, and sort of prepared for what is going to be for the next uh, many, many years to come, right? So for this particular session, we have uh, two speakers, uh, both are basically um, uh, going to talk about drugs as well as vaccine. All right, so we have our first speaker, Dr. Aliza Alias. She is a senior pharmacist. She's currently working as a pharmacist at HTAR. Hospital Tengku Ampuan Rahima Klang. Um, Dr. Aliza actually was our alumni. She was our student uh, at UITM, right? She graduated with a B Farm Honours in 2005. And in 2014, actually, she uh, completed her master's in clinical pharmacy. And uh, subsequently, in 2020, she was conferred uh, with a PhD in clinical pharmacy. Currently, basically, she actually hit the unit of clinical pharmacokinetic service in the HSA, and she is basically the infectious disease pharmacist in the hospital. She also acts as a training receptor for um, for a lot of uh, teaching hospitals, right? All right. So um, the talk today by Dr. Aliza is uh, pharmacotherapeutics of COVID-19 cases, managing the learning curve. So um, Dr. Aliza has been involved in managing uh, COVID cases in HTAR, which is one of the hospitals that have a lot of cases eh? uh, when we actually have the um, uh, pandemic. So without further ado, can we have uh, Dr. Aliza? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and good morning everyone. Thank you to RMC UITM for inviting me to share my experience as part of a member of frontliners in General Hospital Hishta Klang. Pharmacotherapeutics of in cases, managing the learning curve. I try my best to present the given topic in general, but some of it may require scientific explanation. I hope everyone can bear with me for the next 25 to 30 minutes. Here is my outline for today. My session is more on sharing my experience and empower the roles of pharmacists in preparation to endemic phase. Okay, let's start with introduction. After a sudden emergence of SARS-CoV in Wuhan, China, COVID-19 started to conquer the world. Coronavirus, which has infected and killed millions of people, continues to spread around the world. It has spread to at least 150 countries in Asia and has infected more than 200 million cases since the first case was reported on December 31st, 2019. As we all know, the Delta variant has become a dominant strain in many countries and account for a majority of new infections, including Malaysia. Hence, majority of the country have forced back into lockdown and reimposed harsh restriction as low vaccination rates leave vulnerable people to COVID-19 infection. Looking back at COVID-19 timeline, when the first COVID case hit China in December 2019, WHO was alerted about the current situation. Then, the infection started to spread all over the world, including Malaysia. The first Malaysian confirmed with COVID-19 was on February 2020. The 41 years old man recently returned from Singapore when he started to develop a fever and cough, followed by a 40 years old female Malaysian she has no travel history to infected areas, but she is the youngest sister of the 41 years old man that was confirmed positive earlier on. 
Hence, she was the first COVID-19 patient in Malaysia who contracted the virus via local transmission. On March 2020, Malaysia reported the first sporadic case of COVID-19 where the impact infected person neither travelled to an affected area nor had contact with an infected person and WHO officially declared it as a pandemic on March 2020. Thereafter, the numbers of cases and death further rampant and conquered the world including Malaysia. Let's look at the Malaysian coronavirus curve. The curve showing lesser signs of upward climb after the case declined before and continuously growing upward since then. Selangor State has always been the champion with the daily new cases reported. So, I guess everyone could ever imagine how busy the healthcare team, especially in Klang Valley, managing the COVID case. We need to know the infection characteristic before we are able to tackle the issue. When we get treatment with respiratory symptoms or fever, usually you will be treated as COVID patient until proven otherwise. It is because common signs of COVID-19 infections are similar to the common cold and include respiratory symptoms such as dry cough and shortness of breath. In more severe cases, infection can cause pneumonia, severe acute respiratory syndrome, organ failure and can lead to death. COVID-19 spread from one person to others via droplets that produce from the respiratory symptoms of infected people during coughing and sneezing. According to the current data, time from exposure to onset of symptoms is usually between 2 up to 14 days with average of 5 days. Disease staging and choice of treatment. The disease stage is ranging from asymptomatic up to critical illness. We also categorize it as category 1 to category 5. The higher the disease stage, the severe the disease with higher mortality risk. Patients who have mild illness usually recover at home with supportive care and isolation. For those who have moderate disease or with comorbidity or high risk such as elderly and obesity should be monitored closely and sometimes require hospitalization. Those with severe disease should be hospitalized. If there is clinical evidence of bacterial pneumonia, empirical antibacterial therapy is reasonable to be started but should be stopped as soon as possible if there is no evidence of bacterial infection. Those with critical illness will usually require oxygen support as respiratory failure, shock and multi-organ dysfunction or failure can occur. This stage is very critical because the underlying condition can lead to death. Treatment of COVID-19 depends on the stage and severity of the disease. There are no approved treatments for COVID-19 at this moment, but some medication have been shown to be beneficial. Because of such cough replication is greatest just before or soon after the onset of the symptom, antiviral medication are likely to be most effective when used at early stage. Later in the disease, when hyperinflammatory state and coagulopathy are thought to lead to clinical complication, anti-inflammatory immunomodulators, including steroids, anticoagulants, or combinations of all of all of these treatments may be more effective than antiviral agents. Let's look at the treatment milestone. As lack of concrete evidence and various ongoing trials, we start from the experience in other countries, then continuously keep up to date with the latest concluded and ongoing trials, hence why explaining the changes in treatment option. In the beginning, we use repurposed drugs such as anti-malarial and HIV drug to treat COVID patients taking into account the similar characteristics of the virus. As such, we choose combinations of hydroxychloroquine, interferon, and calitra. Then, 
Kalitra was replaced with Atazanavir after later study at that time showed significant better outcome with Atazanavir as compared to Kalitra. Later on, Favifiravir took place as recommended antiviral in view of better outcome as compared to Atazanavir at that time. We used Favifiravir and also combined the treatment with anticoagulant and immunomodulator to high-risk group of patients, especially in category 3 onwards. Corticosteroid such as dexamethasone or methylprednisolone were used as part of non-specific immunomodulator. However, it is not recommended in non-hypoxic cases unless for other indication. Tocidizumab is an interleukin-6 inhibitor used as a specific inhibitor to stop the hyperresponsive of immune system at the later stage of the disease. The specific immunomodulator is suggested to be given in patients with less than 14 days of illness. The treatment combination showed good response and was continued for quite some time. Further on, baricitinib, a genus kinase inhibitor, was introduced as another choice of specific immunomodulator beside tocilizumab. All the selection criteria to choose either baricitinib or tocilizumab is mainly decided by ID consultants and ICU intensivists. For example, the selection criteria of patient to be start with tocilizumab is choose by evidence based such as intubated patient, pregnancy patient, and patient with end-stage renal function where the use of baricitinib is contraindicated. Currently, the latest findings show that remdesivir is superior antiviral as compared to others including introductions of regin cough as a monoclonal antibodies. Hence why most of the latest available guidelines suggested remdesivir and regin cough as the drugs of choice in managing COVID patients, especially in early stage of the disease. Remdesivir shows maximum benefit in patients if we start to the patient with less than 10 days of illness, but contraindicated to be used in EGFR or patient with renal function less than 30 mL per minute. Raging cough is an antibody that can bind to SARS-CoV and prevent the virus from entering the cells and infecting them. It is recommended to be given to patients with less than 7 days of illness, elderly patients, more than 50 years old, including high-risk patients with comorbidity as they have found to be effective or have a protection to those high-risk group of patients from hospitalization and death. This is the latest NIH guideline listed the latest treatments for COVID infection. Not to forget, our local MOH guideline recently updated for the latest management of COVID-19. To choose the latest and up-to-date therapeutic drugs, which study or trial that we refer to? Here are some of the examples of the listed trials. Please note that there are still many more ongoing trials that could also guide us in giving latest information. Let's look at the interesting finding of this listed trial. ACTT1 trials was published in November 2020. The study found out that remdesivir was superior as compared to placebo in shortening the time to recovery in adults patients. Recovery Trials was published in February 2021. The trial showed that 
use of dexamethasone resulted in lower 28 days mortality that require oxygen support as compared to other standards of care. Solidarity trials was also published in February 2021. The group of researchers looking at the repurpose of antiviral drugs consists of remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir, and interferon regimen. However, the study shows that all of these regimen had little or no effect on hospitalization patients with COVID-19. ACTT2 trials was published on March 2021. The study looking at the combinations of remdesivir with baricitinib as compared to use of remdesivir alone. The study shows that the combinations of remdesivir with baricitinib reduced the recovery time and accelerating improvement in clinical status. Also, such combination was associated with fewer serious adverse events. REMAP-CAP trials was published in April 2021, looking at the group of critically ill patients with COVID-19 received organ support in ICU. The treatment shows that combinations of standard of care of COVID-19 treatment with interleukin-6 inhibitor such as tocilizumab and sarilumab improve the outcome including the survival. In view of COVID-19 is a global pandemic issue. We should anticipate the issue in terms of stock interruption crisis and therefore trial that suggested for alternative to the current treatment regimen is highly useful and recommended. Hence, Stop COVID-19 that was published recently in July 2021 is a trial that look at the alternative for genus kinase inhibitor, which is tofacitinib. The finding shows that tofacitinib shows a lower risk of death and respiratory failure through day 28 as compared to placebo. Therefore, tofacitinib is suggested to be used if baricitinib is not available, as well as sarilumab, referred to remap cap trials, is recommended to replace tocilizumab in the events of tocilizumab is not available or feasible. With all the latest available findings from recent RCT, certain drugs are no longer recommended to be used at this time in view of no clinical benefit. I would like to share our unpublished local data regarding tocilizumab and baricitinib between July and August 2021. When we start to learn from our experience, changing in selection criteria was found to show significant faster recovery where the length of stay is shortened in both group of tocilizumab and baricitinib in August as compared to July. In addition, we also found out that number of death was also significantly reduced in tocilizumab and baricitinib group respectively. So we can conclude that start treatment in early stage could give better outcome to the patient. I think most of us should agree about the roles of COVID vaccine. COVID vaccine is like our new hope to our country after we started our national vaccination program on February 2021. Till definitive treatments for COVID-19 is available, vaccination remains the best preventive weapon in combating the infection. Despite all the issues that has been discussed before, what are the challenges and points to learn in the future? Firstly, about vaccine refusal and hesitancy group. Secondly, about the awareness of COVID-19 infection. We should strengthen effective public engagement 
and communication to ensure right information is given to the public. In addition, we should increase access to vaccination, especially in remote areas, as well as present vaccination as a social norm to reinforce the message that vaccination is widely accepted worldwide. So, who is the right person in overcoming these challenges? I could say that healthcare worker can be part of the best spokesperson because they have a trustworthy voice in achieving all these criteria. Thirdly, the issues about antimicrobial resistance. How it can happen? It happened due to the most of the critically ill patients may develop severe complications with co-infections or secondary bacterial infection and require the extensive use of antibiotics. In addition, it's because of the inappropriate use of antibiotics and lack of antibiotic monitoring where the antimicrobial stewardship activities is deprioritized during the pandemic. So, how could we help this? We can start to enforce and adhere with the EMS activities. Also, practice the judicious use of antibiotics and compliance to infection and prevention control. Fourth issue is about the stock interruption and availability. Treatment interruption can always happen in the events of stock issue related to drugs, non-drugs, including PPE. Therefore, require fast action on finding the replacement or alternative. And lastly, about the false involvement of virus characteristics and treatment. Therefore, we need to keep up to date to the current issues as well as latest management of COVID infection. Then, how pharmacists could help during this current pandemic and overcoming the challenges? As a summary, pharmacists can be considered as healthcare professionals with holistic role such as drug counsellor, giving good information related to drugs as well as vaccine awareness and outreach program. Also can help in busting the myth and neutralizing the misleading info. Pharmacists also can be a very good gatekeeper, looking at the possibles of drug-drug interaction, polypharmacy, as well as be part of the antimicrobial stewardship AMS team. And also not to forget to report all the adverse drug reaction related to the COVID treatment as well as adverse events related to immunization. We also can be a very good drug consultant in view of our knowledge in pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic, we could help in giving advice to choose what will be the best treatment to be given as well as suggest for the dose adjustment in those patients who need it as well as suggest for drug alternative in the events of stock interruption or any other issue. We also can be a good purchaser and supplier. We help in procurements of drug non-drug as well as vaccine and not to forget self-test kit. We also can be a part of the researcher in new developments of drugs, vaccine, hand sanitizer and also others. We can be in the team to develop guidelines also involved in clinical trial. Last but not least, be a drug enforcement officer this is very crucial at this time related to the registered and unregistered product, especially illegal drug supply. I would like to take this opportunity to share what we have done in HTA as part of the members of Frontliner. 
The norm of counselling service was changed from face-to-face -face counselling to virtual counselling, especially in COVID ward to reduce the risk of COVID transmission to healthcare worker. The audiovisual guide was found to be useful, especially to the patient currently. We can share the video and leaflet at the end of the counselling session to ensure continuous of care and correct use of device and therapeutic drugs to the patient. We have successfully developed a number of local guidelines, including venous thromboembolism guide, steroid algorithm guide, as we also emphasize on steroid conversion. This information was found to be useful among the practitioner, especially in the events of talk interruption and discharging the patient that requires steroid tapering dose. During the admission, use of nebulizer is not recommended as the debatable on the risk of transmissions of COVID-19. Until the patient is confirmed COVID negative, all the patient with respiratory symptoms may require to convert to MDI. Hence why, the nebulizer to MDI conversion dosing guide is another useful guide that has been produced by pharmacy team. Another local guide that we have successfully distributed was our switch it guide. Our aim to discharge the patient as soon as possible to reduce the risk being contracted with COVID infection from the hospital. Therefore, this guide is very useful that could help the physician with the information to discharge patient with the best oral antibiotic. To those well patient but require long-term parenteral antimicrobial therapy, we will recruit the patient under outpatient parenteral antimicrobial therapy or OPAT service. Parenteral antimicrobial therapy will be given to the patient as outpatient, but patient has to come to OPAT clinic daily for the administration or changing the infusor back. Infusor is the types of elastomeric pump as a medical device with constant flow rate that require drug to be infused for 24 hours. The infusor is recommended to be used with multiple daily dosing drugs. With this, patient is allowed to continue their daily routine at home and workplace. Another successful story is our telemedicine service. We are happy to say that we are pioneer to start with such service. The service consists of multidiscipline consultation by doctors and pharmacists via online platform. And at the end of the clinic session, patient will apply through online for the choice of medicine supply. We will offer to the patient the choice of medicine supply such as delivery medicine via mail, drive through and medication in the locker. With such, we can able to reduce the risk of patient contracted with COVID-19 from the hospital as well as continuous medication supply can be carried out successfully too. Last but not least, the take-home message to everyone. The silver lining that we can learn from this pandemic. We learn about SOP with the new norm, wearing masks all the time, especially in crowded place, use hand sanitizer and wash hands all the time as well as physical distancing. Also, we learn about unity, together fight the infection. We also start to learn and aware about the importance of vaccination. And lastly, improve the healthcare service through many more invention and technology. So, are we ready to fight this together? Nothing is impossible. Either we are ready or not, it is assured that we will battle this with our best and will heal from this pandemic. Even though fighting the COVID-19 infection can be overwhelming and give a significant burden to the healthcare worker, it is our responsibility to ensure the well-being and the best treatment to our patient. With that, I end my presentation and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Aliza, for a very informative talk. Yeah? Hi, Dr. Hello. Hi, Dr. Day. Hi. Um, yeah, I mean, I was amazed uh, with a lot of activities that actually has been done by uh, yourself, your team, as well as at Star. Thank and you. I was basically looking at, you know, the whole uh, sort of milestone that you put up. It was like so much drugs that was actually um you know involved uh when you actually treat patients with COVID, right i'm just wondering how much is the cost like you know when actually uh, a patient is, is actually hospitalized how much does the government pay per per, per patient right, in terms of the treatment cost with in view of all the drugs that it has to be used okay 
Um, sorry for the noise interruption because I'm doing it outside. So uh, just be sorry lah if let's say the, the sound is not so clear. So in terms of cost, uh, I would say that under government policy, KKM, is actually treatment for COVID is free for all the patients. Okay, unless it says a uh, patient get treatment in private hospital, but in government hospital, all is free. And but the purchasings of the medications definitely is quite high, um, expensive. So I would say that for example, tocilizumab per treatment per vials costs about thousand plus per dose, uh, as well as baricitinib for to complete the treatments for 14 days up to maximum 14 days also require about 1000 1000 plus um price and not to say other things as well as the PPE also the uh, drugs the disposable item and so on so i will say that there's a lot of uh, cost incur in this uh, to manage the covid uh, treatments in hta and also in government hospital that bear by the government yeah I can see that. So I think outside here, what we can do is at least to prevent ourselves from getting uh, COVID, you know, protect ourselves. At least that is what we can do as a rakyat court, yeah? to actually reduce the burden of, um, you know, um, a lot of cost that is involved in treatment, you know. Right. Um, just, um, just another question, right? I mean, um, now you have a lot of data with regards to, um, you know, the drugs that we use for treatment of patients at different kind of phases. Um, mm -hmm. What are you going to use that data for? Uh, are we going to, you know, um, yeah, what is your next plan on, on using this data? Uh, you mean the local unpublished data? Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. I see there's a lot of info there actually. Yes. So the the trials that I shared with uh during the presentation is actually most probably happen in uh, outside of the country. So definitely local data is uh, very important to us, especially uh related to our population because some of the data would say that other population might doing good with this uh, certain drugs, but not to us. So we are actually uh other hospital is active um, try to publish this local data to educate uh, the local people as well as to educate other uh, other country, let's say Asia country that close to our population also. So there's a lot of planning to do that, uh, just a matter of time and hope that we can be able to do it as soon as possible. Right. Um, I was just wondering, did you come across with, you know, um, Recently, I think Merck announced that they, they actually have one new drug that is uh, uh, that they released called Monopiravir. Uh, no, Monopiravir. That are actually good, Yeah, that is actually good against Delta, Gamma, and Mu kind of uh, uh, COVID, right? So, um, mm -hmm. what is your stand on this? I mean, um, uh, one is. Um, uh, what do you think about the product and also is uh, our government planning to actually also get this drug in Malaysia? <laughs> do you have any info? Okay, so Molnupiravir is a types of oral antivirals, right? It's actually produced by Merck company that I'm aware of. Um, our recent uh, National Infectious Disease Conference before did conclude that it shows uh, some things like a uh, good finding, but it's too early to tell the effects. Lah. So I would say that it's comparable with remdesivir. So we try with remdesivir uh, first. At this moment, molnupiravir is not available yet at image. Uh, but I'm not so sure what we the government plan for this. Maybe soon, uh, we might be in medication. But as for now, um, because that is uh, too early to see that effect because the recent study that I, I read uh, from I think, published in June 2021, um, they're, they're looking at the digital data showing a better in terms of safety and efficacy. But again, the conclusion is uh, too early to, to comment about the effects. All right. Thank you, Dr. Aliza. I think. Um, um before i close this session uh i would like to also ask you know the participants if you have any burning questions that you would like to you uh, know uh ask dr aliza
Um, all right. I think uh, if there is no more question, just 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 um, you know, uh, Doctor Aliza, just quickly, just now because you mentioned also that you people have produced a lot of guides, right? And, and uh, one of it is actually, uh, I think, of particular interest to the public will be the uh, the, con the consumption of herbs, <laughs> whether it is actually um, okay or not for the public to actually consume herbs while they take drugs, or is it good? I mean, what kind of herbs that you know under NPRA they have approved certain herbs to be used uh, for to fight COVID? Uh? Okay, um, I'm not good in saying this about the, the use of herbs because of uh, we are not uh, actually encouraged to use of herbs to all of our patients, respectively in our hospital. But I do heard that uh, hospital Sungai Pulau or some of, some of the other hospital is having clinical trials regarding Chinese herbs in, uh, in treatments of COVID. But I have no idea what will be the results as well as what will be the, the outcome or effects of, uh, towards the COVID treatment. So, personal opinion to say that uh, we are not advised uh, patient to combine the uh, treatments, COVID treatments, the conventional treatment with uh, drugs, uh, sorry, with herbs or traditional medicine in view of we are also not so sure about the effect or this, the, the safety of the current um, COVID treatment for the time being. So if let's say we combine with other herbs or, or, or traditional medicine, we don't know what will be not happen to the patient. Is, is there any trial that is registered that you know of, uh, you know, with regards to the use of herbs by traditional medicine, you know, with NPRA? Um, yes, I heard mm -hmm. one, but I have not read uh, further on that. Very, very sorry on that. Thank so, you. but I, 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 I know that uh, Sungai Bulo is trying some of the patients. Other hospital is offered to, to, to give that additional herbs to patients. So, but I'm not so sure the details of the medication. It's, it's good in the sense that at least um, many strategies have been tried from all perspectives, right? Yeah, I think um, <laughs> Dr. Aliza's <laughs> line is not really that good. She's struggling also to actually read the book. Yeah. Um, so um, can I ask again, is, is there any questions from the audience or the participants? Any question for Dr. Aliza? So if there is no more question, we would like to thank Dr. Aliza for joining us in this session, despite your very heavy schedule, right? We understand you are actually involved in some other activities as well, but we really appreciate that you actually you know, manage to take time out to actually be with us and share with us. You know, at least now we know actually there are so much drug that is used in patients, right, when they are hospitalized, not just oxygen, we got, because as a rakyat outside here, we always think that, well, COVID patients administered, they are only relying on oxygen because that's what we heard. No more oxygen, not enough oxygen tank and things like that, right? So, you're right. And, and I think, yeah. Um, <laughs> And also the pharmacy team, uh, thank you so much for coming up with so many guidelines, you know, and then helping to make the uh, public understand of COVID, you know, and the drugs that they use and, and, uh, and also making themselves actually be aware of how dangerous uh, are themselves. All right. With that, thank you very yes. much, Dr. Thank Aliza. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. Um, Okay, if you have any other question, you can actually just type in the uh, um, chat box. Uh, and we can get back to Dr. Aliza and also uh, ask a question for you. So we will go to the next speaker, Dr. Uh, Dr. Liu, right? All right, Dr. Liu basically graduated in biotech at University of Science Malaysia. And uh, he has worked at several places uh, with a lot of experience. He has worked at Ames. He also actually worked in UITM before. He was our previously our lecturer in UITM. And before he actually continued his doctoral study at University of Queensland, Australia. All right. 
Dr. Uh, Liu actually did his PhD thesis on investigation of the potential vaccine targeting targeting against system, cytosome infection. And during his PhD study, he received uh, Edward Jenny Award conferred by Australia Centre for Vaccine Development attributed to his PhD research finding. Congratulations, yeah, Dr. Liu, for such an uh, amazing achievement and award. And upon completion of his doctoral study, Dr. Liu took up a role in clinical lab scientist at Q Farm, uh, uh, proprietary limited work company, working on human vaccine clinical studies. Eh? So he was then offered a postdoctoral scientist role at Molecular Immunology Lab at QIMR, Bergofield Medical Research Institute, to study the role of T cell in initiating immunity against chronic malaria and human colorectal cancer. So in September 2014, Dr. Liu joined USM as a lecturer. So now he is actually a lecturer, senior lecturer at the pharmacy school of USM. He currently holds three national research grants and is a supervisor of two PhD and four master's students. At such a young age, he has actually achieved a lot of, um, you know, uh, high achievement. Yeah? Dr. Liu's primary research interest actually focuses on understanding of the molecular basis of immunity associated with infectious diseases. And the principal aim of the research is to identify potential vaccine and therapeutic targets for immunotherapeutic uh, development. So we really have got, got the right person to actually speak with us today on the strategy in vaccine development. Yeah? So without further ado, um, I would like to invite Dr. Liu to actually share with us his experience as well as uh, um, interest on and also, you know, insight into strategies to develop vaccines since Malaysia is also moving towards, uh, you know, uh, vaccine development, right? Uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, um, good morning again and thank you very much again for Prof Teh for the nice introduction about my, my myself. Actually, I'm not that good that I mentioned by Prof Teh, but I'm still learning. I want to say thank you very much again to Prof Teh. I'm learning so much from you when I was in UITM. Of course, to Prof Baka as well because uh, he always, uh, you both all are always my seafood, first of all. And then because I, concurrently, I have a, another new student orientation, but my part just finished because we have to introduce myself. But I feel very proud again because Prof Habiba, our dean, keep mentioning about UITM and Probaka for leading the School of Pharmacy that successful. So uh, I just want to share this good story with you guys. So anyway, uh, thank you very much again to Prof, uh, uh, Prof Teh and to everyone of here. My name is Guy. So, but uh, I don't want to spend more time to introduce myself because uh, Prof Teh already uh, briefly tell about my background. So without further ado, let me try to share the screen that I'm going to share with you uh, today. All right. Please give me a second. Okay. So, uh, Prof. can you see the slide over here? Yes, but maybe you can project it. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, it works right. Okay. Right. Uh, because this uh, this slide, actually, I tried to it's, touch on the briefly on general stumps of, about the vaccine development or the strategies in the vaccine development. Uh, so. So the, I would like to be to be shared uh, on today's lecture, uh, to, not lecture, sorry, today's webinar for my topic will be on this kind of like seven topics. If first of all, we start it with the history of the vaccination, just a, a brief tour about that and followed by the concept of vaccinations and then the strategies uh, adopted for the antigen discovery and what kind of the modern strategies which are used for the COVID-19 vaccine development and uh, a list of the adjuvants which are approved for the human use as well. And the common the common components of the vaccines development uh, particularly for the today's vaccines and uh, the finally it will be including some of the important factors uh, which have to we, we need to consider while we try to design or develop the vaccines uh, that which will affect the vaccine effectiveness okay so first of all we don't, uh, let me start it with the history of vaccinations so as we know that the, the vaccines, when we talk about vaccines, it should be, we call something, we call it as a smallpox, which has been found more than 10,000 years ago. But of course, we are so lucky today because this disease has been fully eliminated using the vaccine alone. All right, this smallpox was caused by a virus caused by variola, but it is not the RNA virus like when we have coronavirus today, it was a kind of a DNA virus. Unfortunately, that time, because uh, the technology was still like, uh, not that good compared uh, like today so a uh, lot a lot of people died within the 10,000 years because it, this disease actually found 10,000 10, years ago and it leads to one of the the Egyptian king 
uh, like this uh, mummy on the next slide is a uh, mummy of the uh, the the king's name is the uh, Lamses number five, who died in the one thousand plus before the century. So it shows that uh, this disease is how bad it was. It can it can lead to the uh, the the damage of the one of the whole whole empire. All right. So until uh, one thousand AD, this disease was finally uh, found a kind of the treatment control. Which, but the, the early treatment control, it was named as a variolations. This variolation actually it was uh, initiated uh, by, uh, by in, in the mainland China by the Buddhists. It's called in the roughly 1000 to 15th century between the period. The way of what he did it was uh, because he found that uh, when a healthy person when introduced some time, something like a pus or the scabs, the dry scabs from the, from the skin, and then they use old mortar pestle and to grind it into the powder form, dry up and blew it into the nostril or the nose of the healthy. And couples, uh, sometimes later, they found that the, pay, the, the individual can be free of the kind of the, these smallpox infections. So this technique was, uh, I can say, it uh, is slightly safe. Uh, not safe, it's, it's not really safe because they use the least smallpox uh, scabs. But the thing is, it saved a lot of people from getting the infections. However, around roughly about 30, uh, 30% of the overall people who receive this kind of scabs are not sure they still receive a kind of like a, uh, the, the challenge because they're, they're still using the small the real small post only the scabs so sometimes maybe the, the scabs itself might be contaminated with the real virus or the, the alive virus so it's been this technique even though because that time it doesn't it did not have this particular good techniques so this variation techniques last in the in the world for about 400 years uh, about 300 years until two to the discovery of the next, uh, we call it uh, the first world vaccine. All right, what what uh, this kind of first world vaccine was discovered by a physician uh, named as uh, Evgenia. He's a uh, Dr. Evgenia. So in the early of like 18, uh, in the near to the 18th century in 1976, he found that uh, a, a very big uh, discovery where the daily mat did, did not. Uh, infected with this kind of the the smallpox and more as long as they are they they were they are given any exposure to the couples before so he found a very surprising uh, kind of like a very excited things because how come a, a lady was infected with the cowpox but she will not get infected with the with the smallpox anymore and then he he found that uh, because he, he he was a physician he found that then he tried to look at this cowpox and the smallpox actually looks quite similar, but unfortunately that time he did not have any genomic sequencing thing. So he this is all from his hypothesis. But he was very, very brave. Because what he did was he tried after he did some experiment, he tried to uh, inoculate the same cowpox on the on the son of the gardener, eight years old. But of course that, that thing cannot be done by today because that time was the, the, the legalism was not really uh, tight, right? So he tried to inoculate the son uh, the uh, the son of the gardener. So using this cowpox, uh, the pus, but it's a kind of the, the, the sterile pus, okay? He inoculated that after two months later, then he tried to challenge the sun using this real smallpox virus again. But so that, that gardener's sun was after safe, which means nothing happened. So he proved that his, his techniques were right. It means that the cowpox can be used to protect against the smallpox infections. So since that time, a lot, a lot of so-called like clinical trial was tried to, to uh, apply for a lot of the, the healthy individuals. And finally, he, his concept was, his hypothesis was true. So, showing that the using of the smallpox, uh, using of the cowpox can be used as a kind of the antigen to protect against the smallpox, which, which is much more safer compared to, to the very recent technique before. So this technique, after that, they, they, it was named as a vaccine because of the name of the vaca. The vaca is a Latin word uh, to show that it's a cow. So which means the vaccine that we use today actually originate is from the, uh, from the discovery of the this original from the cow before. And the, the, this technique was later introduced to, to the world by WHO in the uh, early of like, like uh, early before, after the World War I. All right, it was introduced throughout the world and showing that this uh, techniques work, uh, it was working and it really can help a lot of people to get free from the smallpox infection anymore as we can see from the diagram over here the smallpox, smallpox endemics actually it was pandemic around the world 
And after that, in 1945, because it has been partially controlled, and since 1945, it has been the smallpox vaccinations uh, programs uh, was declared as a, one of the important uh, max vac 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 uh, vaccination program by the WHO. So you can see the, the uh, we call it as the, the endemic area here, uh, all covered by the red color is the endemic uh, smallpox reasons. After vaccination treatments, it took 20 years, so it reduced to only the parcel countries. We, we received the, less, uh, the least of the vaccines. So we spend most of the countries are free from the smallpox. And the last smallpox uh, infections was found uh, on this guy, Ali, and uh, we, uh, in 1977. And no more smallpox case was found after 1978. So we spend the vaccine, it really helps in this kinds of the pandemic uh, control vaccination. But of course, it takes time. So we have to be patient. So after they discovered the smallpox vaccines, we can see the evergenous techniques has been applied for so many different kinds of the vaccines including from the rabies, corona, uh, polio vaccines, followed by this hemophilus and hepatitis A. And lot of virus uh, was the followed by that. And the, the new one that come is the HPV vaccines. I think this one was discovered by firstly in, in, in Australia by uh, 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 Sir, uh, the, uh, Professor Ian, Professor Ian Fraser, yep. And followed by the uh, Ebola, Ebola vaccines. I think this technique was pretty much, this can be considered as a starting point for the or can say it's a stepping stone for our today uh, COVID-19 vaccines because the, the mRNA vaccine actually, or, or we call it as a, from the, uh, from the AZ, the kind of the, we call it as a cap capsid vaccine, actually is all risk from this Ebola vaccine techniques. Followed by, that's why we, we have this kind of the good uh, development on the vaccine development. So we have uh, the COVID-19 vaccines developed that quite well uh, and, and in the uh, uh, fast pace. Next, we have uh, before I want to to touch more on the on the vaccines development. So let's have uh, some look onto the what what the gene the, the the vaccine means. Actually, vaccine doesn't have too much difference compared to the real infect, uh, infections. The but the the huge difference between that there's a risk and without risk. As we see, or the if let's say someone infected with death, let's say COVID nineteen. Okay, so they they are four possibilities that could be happen to the individuals. First, they could be survive, or they could be like. Uh, death, all right. This is as uh, we can see from the case. Or disability is depends. It maybe it's not from the COVID nineteen, but it, it caused by other other infections. For example, like uh, uh, the uh, JE, the uh, Japanese encephalitis, something like that. Okay, and then of course, when someone infected with these uh, their infe uh, infections, of course they will still have the immune response. If let's say after recover, this is very common, all right. However, compared to the vaccines. Vaccine, it doesn't similar to a real antigens. Of course, it is a mimic to that, which means either they use a Q vaccine or they use a kind of attenuated form or they use a recombinant form or a mRNA form like we, we, we are going to discuss later. All right, the, usually this kind of vaccine, they won't cause any disease. Of course, they will cause something like very mild uh, adverse effect, like uh, maybe fever, something like this. It's very common because our body uh, has uh, was induced about the response against uh, the, the introduction of these particular vaccines. So there are two possibilities will be uh, left over from this uh, vaccine uh, vaccine introduction. For example, like uh, the, of course, most people will like, get the cover with, like what we, we what we are today because we get the cover of uh, after vaccinations. Usually, the vaccine will bring about like fever maybe for one or two days something like that. All right, and then of course we will have a memory, uh, immune memory cell left over, and this this and disabilities is very very rare case. They are very rare case and they seldom happen on the vaccines because the vaccine can only be introduced into the market after the very strict clinical trial explain has been done, all right? So of course, when we talk about the, the this kind of vaccine concept, we have to understand the, about how the things work. Of course, when we, of, uh, on the news now, usually people, they will talk about like antibody, antibody, because antibody level supposedly is very important. However, it's, it's only happened on this B cell level. However, when the vaccine itself has, is introduced into the body, we need to understand that antigens has, will be first introduced to the uh, because the antigen presenting cell like a macrophages, ligand cell on the skins, and the mono, uh, low monocyte on even the B cells. Okay, they play a very important role. And then all these cells will present or will represent their things onto, uh, uh, or they, they will engulf the antigens and representing it onto the, to this kind of, because I, on, if let's say normally we call it MHC, or usually in human we call it HLA, human leukocyte antigens. 
Because this is very important, we can see this is the intact antigens. After processing, they will be turned into the uh, and uh, this uh, peptide or immunogen peptide. And this immunogen peptide will either be presented to the CD4 T cell through the MAC class 2 or to the CD8 T cell through the MAC class 1. So it depends on what kind of process it works. So all this, we can design it through the vaccine design. As long as we know, we understand how the thing works for on this MAC class 1 class 2. All right. So now we're going to have some brief on these strategies used for the antigen discovery. So in the past, uh, like uh, what happened to the smallpox, toro vaccines, all those, uh, the old vaccine, MMR as well, they use this kind of like very conventional techniques. Of course, uh, if let's say you want to do research starting from the scratch, is is very laborious and time consuming. All right. The, the other thing is very, very expensive because you, the scientists have to get involved a lot of different uh, stakeholders to ensure that the vaccines are the whole platform itself works starting from the cell culture all right you have to count it let's say bacteria we have to culture a lot of bacteria let's say we if let's say for culture for, for viruses we have to culture a lot of viruses and make use of a lot of different uh, facilities all right another thing is for these whole things you we have to slay part by part either on, on maybe on the out, uh, outer membrane or something else maybe we are uh, on the part, different areas so we have the scientists need to test it one by one of the particular antigen and then to know about the uh, immunogenicity and this one only for the discovered antigen will take from like five to ten years all right this is very long and to test about the immunogenicity again they have to another another maybe five to fifteen years to test until to the vaccine level. so that's why in the past usually a, a, a vaccine for example like a polio vaccine it took about like uh, uh like 20 years to finish up a vaccine before launching the market so it really, really not off. 20 years is a very normal, but certain vaccine can go up to like 30 years or 40 years. It depends on the different vaccines. However, the other time, the, the because of the advanced technologies like this kind of the genomics and proteomics technology, especially the bioinformatics technologies. Like today we have this NGS thing, right? I think uh, that's very, uh, like Prof. Tech, you, you are the expert in this area. So it really helps on the vaccine development. Why? Because we can save the time on this uh, antigen, uh, antigen discovery. Of course, we can base on the genome that we discover, and then we start to use the different algorithms to, to do the prediction on this kind of the, uh, anti, uh, uh, the antigen protein. So because of saving the time over here, so we can use this, uh, the selected uh, proteins for our own immunogenicity uh, study within one to two years. So this technique is not very new. Later on, I will discuss later that this, it was actually discovered by, or introduced by a very top scientist from GSK in the world. It's a uh, Dr. Uh, Lidon Napuri. So this technique, actually, they come up for the first, uh, 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 we call it uh, meningitis vaccines, which has been, uh, because no one can find this meningitis vaccine in the past, but he, he, he was the one to use this technique to find the, the vaccines and launch by GSK into the market since 2000, uh, in the early of 2000. All right. Okay, now let's... Later on, I will discuss about strategies. So now some introduction about the modern strategy used for the COVID-19 vaccine development. Of course, certain people will ask, how come the, today the COVID-19 vaccines, the development was so fast compared to the traditional vaccines? Okay, we let's look at this diagram. Uh, like, diagram like just now what I mentioned, that was part of the technology, like a, uh, advanced technology discovery for the vaccine candidates. And uh, the part of you, just because of the the vaccines for, for this has of 2 is different from other vaccines. First, they have a lot, the whole world, especially like the FDA and the whole world, the, the whole world of the like top institute, they, they put in a lot of efforts and a lot of money. All right. So money solves a lot of issues. So another thing is a lot of people get involved. Collaborators around the whole world, they get involved to help to share the data each other. And the most important thing is because the of the technology, the advanced te technologies in genomic sequences, after, like just now, Professor mentions, after the COVID nineteen for this, that time was declared as Wuhan Wuhan virus, right? Wuhan SARS CoV Wuhan something like that. So it was discovered by the end of uh, uh, November. So actually, the 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 sequence of that particular SARS CoV two was discovered within a month. All right. So between in the early of the January, the the full genome of the SARS CoV two has been discovered. So because they can compare this SARS CoV two compared to the previous uh, coronavirus infections including the SARS-CoV-1 found in uh, Guangzhou and Hong Kong in uh, early of uh, like 2004. And they also compare it to the MERS found in uh, 2012 in the uh, Middle East. So they, they make conclusions saying that, so they can confirm this is a kind of the coronavirus infections 
and it share a very high similarity compared to the to their uh, family group member of the SARS CoV one. So because of the previously the SARS CoV the vaccine they were again the SARS CoV and MERS has vastly been done. So there uh, there has been a lot of data accumulated to be served for these SARS CoV two infections. So of course at the early stage of here, so so uh, let me try to use this pointer. So uh, sorry. Okay, because at this early stage, a lot of things have been saved all the time. So when it comes to clinical stages, of course, a compared in comparison to the old uh, to the traditional method, for the because it's pandemic, right? A lot of things need to be saved. So time is the first uh, consideration. So a lot of things they try to make it into the overlapping clinical trials, which means that while uh, the phase one is already uh, initiated. So if let's say the result is acceptable, phase two is overlapping or continuous to start it without waiting for the uh, to end up all the reporting submission before they start to the uh, to the phase two. So that's why this overlapping clinical trial that really helps to to accelerate this kind of vaccines launching into the market. And then everything was right, including the launch of emergency use of the vaccines by the FDA something like that. So of course the vaccine compared into compared to like it goes to take up for fifteen or more than fifteen years or more than that. However, for COVID-19 vaccines, just because of the pandemic issue, right? So the vaccine can be solved within one year and launched in the market. Of course, it is safe and efficient. So uh, uh, some of the, uh, the techniques used for the COVID-19 vaccines, just because of time issue, a lot of the conventional techniques cannot be applied. Say, for example, the whole, whole virus vaccines using the live attenuated one or the inactivated one, because this one usually takes time very long. And also the protein subunit vaccines, of course, you need to clone it and express the protein sometimes and purify it. So it takes really a slightly long time. So usually a lot of new companies like Pfizer and Moderna from US, they chose to use this uh, nuclear acid vaccine so on mRNA, uh, uh, mRNA vaccine platform. Why do they use to choose mRNA vaccines? Just because of they want to make the things that are very similar to this coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, because this is an RNA vaccine as well. So they're going to use a similar pathway like happen like what uh, SARS-CoV-2 infecting the, hu uh, the human as well. So that's why this one, they really say, uh, in terms of production, they save time. And in terms of the uh, quality control, it really is uh, badly controlled because uh, this is all uh, produced through synthetic, it, uh, not like using the real virus and you culture in the lab, like what Sinovac did in, in, in China. They, they, of course, they had the, the good factory, I think, maybe, so that they can produce a lot of the, the the identical virus and they kill it, uh, so they turn it into the inactivated virus. But for this uh, Pfizer, uh, Modena, they use the mRNA, mRNA platform. For the AZ or this cancer bio, they use this kind of as a viral vector platform, which means that they they put the DNA into the, uh, they, they do the transfection technique, something like that, and they cover it with kind of the, uh, this uh, another adenovirus uh, capsid. So that's why this adenovirus capsid can play itself like an uh, adjuvant. So this uh, AZ, usually they don't add it with any adjuvants because capsid itself already kind of adjuvants. And Pfizer, no adjuvant is added as well just because of the use is like, uh, uh, it's a lipid. And then straight away, it can be recognized by, because they, it's targeted to be transfected within the cells. So it's not necessary to be recognized by the immune cells at, at, at first stage. So you, uh, usually muscle cells will straight away to present this on our MSC class one uh, to, the, to, the, to the infections, uh, to the uh, nearby uh, APC. However, Sinovac is still using the very conventional techniques. Of course, uh, the adjuvant still, uh, of adjuvant still need to, to be needed, uh, added to ensure that it can enhance the immunogenicity of this uh, Q inactivated uh, vaccines. We will discuss this briefly, briefly later as well. So currently, there are three different types of the coronavirus vaccines used in the market. The first one, of course, we understand it as like uh, the whole virus. Okay, we call that like whole virus. So here, they mention protein. Actually, the whole virus they kill it, so they use this uh, similar, it's a true virus that has been killed. So maybe some of the protein on the surface structure might slightly be changed because uh, they use maybe either formidehyde or the heat, uh, uh, not formidehyde, it's a kind of the chemical to kill it. Or they, some certain lab maybe use the, uh, the heat to kill them as well. So a certain kind of the stru uh, protein structure might be changed. So another thing standing is like, just now we mentioned, it's like a, from the AZ one, they use this kind of like a viral vector. So the spike, uh, the, the spike DNA was stored in the this viral vector, and then eventually when it comes into the muscle, so it will be expressed as a protein, the spike protein as well. So another one is from the Pfizer and Moderna. They use mRNA, so it's mRNA will get into our human body. Of course, our body will translate it into the 
doing the transcription and translate into the spike protein. So no matter which technique it is, so eventually all this protein, they need we need the protein in this immunogenic protein of this uh, similar to this uh, coronavirus to be presented to our nearby immune cells so that it can trigger our immune response to works. So now I uh, would like to discuss three uh, what kind of the three different techniques used in the lab. Uh, of course, it's not only for the for the COVID nineteen. This is very uh, general. So to to discover the antigens for vaccine use or diagnostic here this topic we focus on vaccines of course there are three different techniques very familiar in the past people they have to use uh, the scientists have to use the whole organism to culture it and then to to try it one by one but because of the advanced te technology for, for example like proteomics studies now we can use the like, immunoproteomics technique to study about this kind of the vaccine discovery what how this uh, how the this uh, uh techniques works right if for, for, for instance Say for example, now we have a COVID-19 antigen or COVID-19. So we try to smash it, we counter them, we smash them, and then we spin them down. So we will get enough of the number of the proteins. So now we will run to a STS page, then we will get the uh, the human serum, all right, or any serum from the infected human and with the control without human. So you try to block it against the, the 2 d gels or the STS page. So any spots found on the on the band there, which means that there's a react reactivity. So then the scientists can cut it off this particular band and send it for the mass spec to know that which protein itself is can be recognized by this serum or the infected serum. So that's why at, at least it shortlist the, the, the uh, how, how to say it shortlist the way that we have to understand about which antigen itself is works right. So at least we know which antigen itself, so we can proceed for vaccine the vaccine study later to study about that even immunogenicity in the mouse model. Okay, another technique. This technique has uh, I I've been using this technique for sometimes in, in my lab. So, but I haven't shown a lot of the data here uh, because this is very a webinar. So, of course, uh, maybe because I can show you or because if let's say anyone interested, because we are going to publish another uh, tech, uh, paper on this one as well. So, this technique is different uh, different from the immunoproteomics. However, this we call it immunopathidomics techniques, which means that as we know that when an antigen or something else engulfed by uh, uh, macrophages or any antigen presenting cells. So a lot of antigen will be going through a, a process and this antigen will be processed and bro broken down into the, we call it as peptide. And only the immunogenic peptide will be bound onto the particular um, either MHC class one or MHC class two, all right? So if let's say what we did is, we, we because the, um, the peptide presented here will be presented to this uh, the nearby T cell, depending on MHC class 1 to CD8, MHC class 2 to CD4. So what we uh, did in the lab, we're going to clip off this particular part. We clip off this particular part like here. We clip this off. Then we try to use the immunoprecipitation method to pull down this uh, particular MHC class 1, class 2. And we, we elute this particular peptide and send for mass spec study. So this technique, which is slightly more reliable than the immunoprotomics techniques, just because of for like just now we mentioned, to make sure that the, the vaccine itself works, of course, the first thing is we want to ensure that the, the, the bow peptide need to be presented to the to the CD4 T cells or CD4. Because CD4 pretty very important though, to, to give the signal to nearby CD8 or, or, or the B cells. All right, so that's why um, in, in my lab, we usually use this technique, at least we know that which part of the segment of that particular antigen is pretty very important role to be recognized by either the two, by by this M, uh, HLA or human HLA, and which is potentially to be presented for the nearby CD4. Okay, so this is kind of uh, uh, from uh, uh, some of the peptides. Of course, not, uh, it's from this paper. It shows that only the peptide, because you may see there are different areas, you may, it might bound on different peptides as well. So this one we will pass uh, briefly to be passed later. So we can see different peptides, they have different uh, affinity to be bound on different uh, DM, uh, HLA. So that's why this peptide play very important role. So it can help us to shortlist about the uh, potential to choose for the uh, potential vaccine candidates for the vaccine development. So this one, this is a guy that just I mentioned, Lino uh, Poli. So he used a much more sophist sophisticated method rather than use a lot of the lab techniques uh, in the forefront. What he did was he, he made use a lot of the genomic techniques we call it like a computational vaccinology, but Napoli called this as a reverse vaccinology. 
how could he call this thing is a reverse? It doesn't mean that the, he started it from the Mars model, but reverse means mean not necessary to make use of the bacteria culture anymore or the virus culture. Simply to start it with the uh, bioinformatics started, so we identify all these kind of the, uh, the uh, immunogenic protein in the lab through the computational uh, algorithms. After solicited which kind of the uh, peptides, then it will be proceed for the protein expression. So it saves time rather to test 1,000 proteins. So it saves time maybe only 100, 100 protein will be tested in the, and then in the house model uh, in the mouse model. If let's say any one of them works, so they will continue for their for their uh, the next level test again, like uh, like to choose for the final candidate. Like here, uh, he chose like this kind of couple of different candidates, uh, NHBA, GNA. This is couple of, um, where uh, candidates has been uh, patented and licensed for the GSK to be used at this Bacillo. The Bacillo actually is a kind of the vaccines uh, introduced in the early of 2000 for the medical medical caucus B. All right. So this medical caucus B vaccine actually was uh, discovered by this uh, laboratory group using this very sophisticated technique. Of course, there's a pro and cons as well. The cons are uh, the, the disadvantages of this technique is because uh, a lot of things, you, it depends on the sophisticated of the algorithm. Because algorithm, if let's say the data tra train train on that particular algorithm, which is not that compatible or, or not that uh, well trained. So sometimes the prediction might be different. So this one has to be uh, given focus as well. So, okay. So another, another vaccine candidates, which is now under the clinical trials, uh, using this kind of like uh, the epitope based vaccine discovery was like uh, this uh, because of RTSS vaccine against malaria. Okay, malaria vaccine, of course, rather because malaria itself, the, the parasite itself is very uh, the lot of different segments is, is they share high similarity with the human. That's that's why when designing the the vaccine against malaria is very tricky. All right, because firstly they share a lot of segments with uh, with human, and the thing is because among the parasites they share a lot of the we call it non-specific because they keep on for them for uh, non-specific uh, segments for for them to helping for uh, evasion use. All right, so the the scientists choose for the very particular uh, epitope which is covering the CD4, CD8 T cells and B cells as well, bound onto the particular hepatitis B antigen as an adjuvant. So they use it as a kind of the uh, epitope based uh, vaccines for the FTSS vaccine. So now the clinical trial already comes into the clinical trial three. I think most of them are, are carried out in the uh, 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 African region as well. So list of the adjuvants, for example, adju because uh, uh, how to say, a vaccines usually for the live attenuated vaccines. That's the best vaccine so far. No adjuvant still needed. Just because of live attenuated is still very similar to the original uh, and the, uh, original ant antigens, which means that they only uh, weaken it, but it is not killed. But a lot of things except BCG, they use uh, the this kind of the attenuated, uh, this kind of the live attenuated, uh, live vaccines. But the rest of the vaccine that we use today are usually are killed or recombinants. Mostly are killed vaccines. Uh, why no replacement for BCG? Just because of the BG, BCG, live BCG is still considered as one of the most potential, potential vaccines, which is much better compared to others. Of course, the law of labs like uh, in USM, Prof. Nasmi did a lot of this uh, against the TB vaccines. So they use a different thing, like they, they try to apply in this kind of recommendation from the techniques also. Hopefully one day we can try to make a find a substitution against the using a live vaccines. Of course, live vaccine itself is very immunogenic. However, it might not be suitable to be used for the immunosuppression patients. All right, because it's the, the, the immunogenic part is too strong. Okay, so to a lot of vaccines, for example, like uh, this from the Sinovac one or other vaccine, they use a lot of vaccine like alum uh, as an uh, adjuvant. Alum has been known as an uh, adjuvant since 1934 because it's a mineral salt and uh, it's a very potent, it, it potential um, element to trigger the, uh, we call it uh, the immune, immune response, particularly for the uh, PS2 response. All right, so if, let's say a that, that's why when we talk about this alum, sometimes is very contradict because if let's say for COVID nineteen vaccines, we supposed to because COVID nineteen itself is an intracellular infection, so for the TS one is very important. But if let's say we use the LM, so sometimes because the pathway might be different, so the, the of course is the vaccine itself still working, but the it switch into the TS two response. So to protect against the TS one might be a bit challenging. So but now luckily the uh, the Chile. The scientists from Chile, because they, they are the they are the one the, the one of the country who will be using the most uh, Sinovac vaccines in the world. 
So they have published a new uh, clinical trial paper showing that actually the Sinovac vaccine itself, actually they can trigger both CD4 and the CD8 T cell as well. So showing that luckily this element not switching it fully to the PS2 response, but maybe the the uh, the COVID-19 antigen cells, antigen itself, they still can induce the TS1 response. All right. Of course, there are still more different adjuvants used uh, uh, for different vaccines. For example, the MF59, AS03, all these vaccines, so they are, they are used in uh, maybe uh, uh, different kind of the, the vaccines, such as like MMR or whatever, all right? So the purpose of having use of the adjuvant is because the sometimes, let's say, the antigens used, for, say, for example, mRNA vaccine or this kind of the spike protein vaccines, so maybe they are too small or whatever. So they are hardly to be recognized by the nearby uh, antigen presenting cell. So because it, let's say it cannot recognize, of course the vaccine itself might not be working. Okay. The first thing is it needs to be recognized by the immune cell. So say for example, this by addition of these adjuvants bound onto this particular maybe protein or whatever. So when when is is recognized by the nearby immune cells because of this adjuvant, but at the same time, this all the protein or antigens also will be recognized by this immune cell. So which means that it will pull in into the cells and go into the process that I just I mentioned. So it can help to enhance the immune response. All right. So this is the purpose of having adjuvants to enhance the immune response. And the common component of the vaccines, like what we have we have in the past, of course, the, we cannot just rely on the antigens. Let's say no matter how good the antigen itself is, because this is on we know it's a core core part of the whole vaccines. Of course, we still need to rely to help it. We still need to have like a adjuvants. Okay, we need to have antibiotics. It is to prevent the contamination during transportation, stabilizers, of course, to, to stabilize the, the structure of the of the, the, the antigens. Preservative, of course, this is to avoid from the contamination by the bacteria of the fungi. And uh, of course, certain things like from the Sinovac uh, production, maybe some of the residue might be left over in the tube as well, but this residue is not toxic or, or, or causing any, any problem. This residue might be because they use the cell line to culture the virus, right? So maybe during purification, partly of the cell line residue still will be left over in the purification. However, this cell line, they usually they are not, they are, they are not, uh, they, they are safe and they won't cause any immunogenic for the for the human use because cell line usually is a cell line from the human cell line as well. All right. But usually for the Pfizer and uh, and uh, AZ, they they not they don't have use using any residue issue because in like for example Pfizer, they using like this. Uh, of course, they have their own. Antigens, they use a lipid out, outer layer just because of they need to protect the the um, the stability of this mRNA. They use a salt as well, like a salt also used as a to to try to make it because our body has a like zero point nine percent saline something. So to make sure that when this uh solution can into the body, it can be it can be mixed together with our with our body uh solutions. All right, and sugar as well. Sugar is to try to protect the supply supplier of these uh, vaccines. So that's why, that's why all the things used in the vaccines are very safe. Lipids we use every day, all the salt and sugar we use every day. All right, so this is very common for the vaccine design. So almost to the end now. So factors affecting the vaccine effectiveness, of course, there are a lot. Of course, when you look at the pink color over here, it shows that this has no, uh, this is will impact on the negative effect on the vaccine effectiveness. For example, old age, immune compromised people, on the underlying health condition, of course, this is very common. Maybe we can know it from our KKM report recently. And the demographic factor as well, including like this high level screening virus, of course, when the virus load is too high, of course, it will, it will lead to the high infection as well. All right. So vaccine, this is like limited access to the vaccine. Of course, this is very common as well. Okay. Another thing is a viral variance. Okay. This variant, like for example, mutation, we can look at like the current, like uh, this, uh, mm, the, the current from this, uh, we call it as a, the variance, what we call it, the recent variance. So it has this kind of the problem also because uh, the the gamma one, alpha, delta, gamma, huh? the delta or gamma, <laughs> they get confused sometimes. Okay, so they have this kind of the, the problem issues. So because one, when the variance turn into a new variance, so the old, back, the previous vaccine, the efficacy might become lesser because of this kind of protectivity might be different. However, so far, all the vaccine still works against these Delta vaccines. So uh, so means that we, we are still safe and we still need to keep ourselves from getting exposed to too much of the virus load or the, or the, or, or we call it as a, everyone else, please make sure that uh, when, if we are qualified, please get vaccination for ourselves. 
Okay, here another thing, certain things, for example, like uh, un, uh, unknown or not confirmation yet, the things, for example, I want to focus is on this uh, genetic polymorphism. Actually, in our vaccine design, this genetic polymorphism, polymorphism is one of the big concerns. I remember that I when I was there was a some webinar, we had a discussion before with the uh, extra genetic tea on this uh, 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 from the, we call it as uh, AZ design. Of course, they said that they supposedly they have to look into this, but because of the uh, pandemic, so they have to put this in the later, so they have to make make sure they, they, they produce the vaccine first so so that it can be used for for the big, uh, for the whole whole world populations. But because genetic problems, if we look at here, it is not new. It is not a very new concept. But it has been found in a, even in the early of 2000 or beforehand. So it's so that a lot of the HLA uh, class one are associated with the peptide binding depictors at different sizes, activities, something like that. So for example, if let's say there are two different individuals, okay, they, they are given similar vaccines. Okay, maybe the HLA uh, individual who breed, who carry the HLA A, they can recognize the peptide easily and then they can present it to the nearby T cells. However, individuals that are given the similar uh, identical vaccines because they carry the different HLA, because the 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 complementary of their pocket is different, so may, this is the reason why why certain people when they receive the vaccines, it seems like they 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 waste enough on the antibody. Of course, antibody will get reduced after up over the times. All right, this is very common. So because antibody won't last in the body for in the top, if less than no exposure, of course it will get diminished. However, the most important is a memory cells, because we we after we read some paper, certain say say that. Two different individuals, two group, uh, two group of the different cohorts, but certain cohorts maybe they have a good memory cells, but certain cohorts they don't have the good memory cells, even though they are given the vaccines. So this might this might be the the reason they call, they lead to the problem. All right. So previously there are some studies to show that actually the different HLA also will cause into the risk of severe uh, or the severity uh, because of the COVID-19 infections. So it shows that this HLA halota or the HLA aerial spray and proton row on this uh, on the infections on the infection severity control. All right. Uh, in short, I just want to mention, like for example, in this paper, HLA somebody who carried this HLA C zero four zero one, they might be experiencing with this kind of the severity, much higher chances compared to others. As we look at this diagram, for example, uh, okay, let me summarize it. Let's look at this. The deep blue color here to show that the those people who enter the ICU, and this the light blue colors, which means the people who are uh, who did not enter the ICU. So this is a group of others, uh, others, uh, HLAC zero four zero one. But this is a C zero zero four zero one. So in comparison for the people who enter the ICU, you can see the zero four zero one. The chances is much higher, almost like ninety percent. I said don't look at this call because this group this call has much lesser zero four zero one. But you can see, look at uh, another group over here. So the group is much higher. So it make a conclusion saying that those who carry the 0,4G1 in Europe, they might be have a high probability to experiencing the uh, the severity, the highest severity when exposed to the COVID-19 infections. Similar case to to other uh, to others as well. For example, because everywhere they, they they might be having different areas, right? So this we have to study it individually. So in short, we have to make it into that vaccine must be designed either to use a very universal vaccines to cover most uh, a peptide which can be rec recognized by most of the people in the world uh, or the uh, or populations. So this is a reason why it's nothing to be relevant to the to the Singapore case. But uh, we can see that in the Pfizer now in Singapore is keep increasing. We don't know whether it is because Pfizer they're using a very short peptide. So we don't know this what the peptide can be recognized by most of the population or not. So a lot of studies still need to be done, all right? So in, this is a list to show that distribution of the HLA alias in Malaysia. We can see it, uh, there's still a long list of us. It's not 18 only, it's still a long list, but this is, I, I try to cut it for the, uh, on the screen. This uh, like 0401, this is uh, DPB1. It's not uh, not different from the HLA, but uh, so we still have a very high chance of here, all right? If let's say a vaccine itself is working for most of the cohort, but they don't working for 0401, so this cohort will be a, a problem, which means that the vaccine might not be functional much or efficiently in this certain cohort. So we need to study it uh, comprehensively to understand whether the association between the vaccines and the uh, and the HLA whether they can they can be recognized by each other or not.
So finally, I just want to mention, could a universe, universal coronavirus vaccine uh, possible to be produced in the future? Because we can, uh, from this diagram, we know that in the early of 2004, there's a sars cov one in Hong Kong. And in the middle of like uh, uh, 2012, we have the MERS. People say <coughs> we still have something in the 1690, but this is uh, not that pandemic more. So we still, it shows that coronavirus, coronavirus infections keep happening across the world. All right. So it doesn't mean that today we have the vaccines against the COVID-19. Maybe in the 10 years from now, everyone will be safe. We don't know yet because this is an RNA virus. RNA virus, the mutation, which is more fragile or have to say more rapid compared to the DNA virus. All right. We do not know if let's say any virus left over in the populations, let's say it turned into something else, into the another type of the virus because the structure is different from the, the influenza. So we are still safe because influ influenza virus is way more complicated than this coronavirus. But we do not know because if let's say in the future, if let's say this Delta, they still left over in the market, uh, in the population for so long, they can still use, make use of the uh, individual or the host body to, to create the new variants again. So if let's say a new variants pop up, we hope that new, new variants might, might go into the alpha, alpha coronavirus. If let's say they get into the different strains, we, we are safe already because only this Beta because they can recognize this ACE2 and bound it tight, tightly, so they cause a pathogen. And so others one usually are safe. Other ones will cut into the body, so it can easily be recognized because they are different because of how, uh, different spikes, right? So it can be moved or eliminated by the body uh, quicker. So it's like that. The concept of virology there are two. Either they can they keep uh, mutating and change itself into a much safer variant, so everyone is safe. Either they still keep mutating and change into a uh, high risk uh, variants, so the same thing could be happen again. But thanks to to the vaccine, I could believe that the coronavirus, uh, the case should be getting less and lesser. And as well, everyone's are given opportunity to be vaccinated. I think the uh, this pathogenic coronavirus should be should be easily controlled uh, at, at least twenty years from now. All right. So the final thing is, we of course we have we still the long run for us. I think especially for Malaysia because now we we are using the vaccine developed overseas in China or in in uh, in United States or UK. So a lot of things might be different from the Malaysian court. So if hopefully we can design uh, something like a universal vaccine which is more suitable to be used for our South Asia because usually like just our uh, genetic poly polymorphisms is very 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 important. Very important. So we have to uh, really focus on this area to ensure that the vaccines to be used for our own cohorts is safe and uh, universal and protective. So a uh, type of matrix here is of course to characterize of the pathogen genomes, transcriptomes or the protein and viral properties offers the op opportunity to select the, the proteins which is likely to elicit the uh, protective immunity. And the exploitation of the genomic and the post-genomic technologies including the bio properties it provides a solution to shorten the time, which is required to identify the vaccine candidates. Selection of the suitable adjuvants is very important because it could enhance uh, appropriately the functionality of a, a protective uh, vaccines. And comprehensively understanding of the human HRA differences, uh, which is very important, which because it's potentially to help in development of the novel vaccines to prevent the future pandemic, particularly in a, our own local cohorts. Okay, and then. Uh, Potent, uh, a more potential protective and, uh, vaccines against coronavirus is essential to be produced, hopefully, uh, to ensure that we, we, are, we will be safe to, uh, in the future. So finally, I want to thank you very much to UITM, as well as to RNC, uh, to Prof. Uh, Dr. Dr. Abu Baka, and uh, to Associate Professor Dr. Mohamed Johari, and to all the committees of the UM, RNC for, for organizing this uh, very uh, insightful uh, webinar. Of course, to thanks to uh, Dr. Liao from uh, USM, and of course to School of Pharmacy, School of Pharmaceutical Sciences for allowing me to or, or giving me opportunity to presenting on, on this uh, webinar. Of course, finally, thanks to everyone and thanks to Prof. Tai again for hosting this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Liu, for yeah. such an extensive talk. Very interesting and uh, many things that you know recap and really learn from myself also. I think a very important message is basic science basically paves the way uh, for a very uh, fast uh, COVID vaccine uh, delivery, I mean, development mm -hmm. this time. Huh? Without all the basic science, I think we couldn't have get a COVID vaccine uh, developed in such a short time. 
uh, I think uh, because of the time limit, uh, do we have any questions from the participants that you want to ask, Dr. Liu? Thank you, Prof. Yeah. Thank you very much, Prof. <laughs> All right. I think, um, yes, I think there's still a lot of research. Maybe we can collaborate also with regards to the HLA polymorphism, looking at the human genomes, you know, um, yep, yep. all those things can be done so that we are more prepared, especially, you know, we are worried that uh, if there is a new variant that actually may pop up, you know, three yep, years yep. is too short. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 could so, possible, it could possible because it, it, any possible could happen because no one can predict about the COVID nineteen as well. Suddenly, it pops to the world just within a within a couple of months, right? So, thank you much again, uh, Prof. and to everyone. Nice to see you all. Thank you, Dr. Liu. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Liu, uh, for an extensive talk. And with that, um, we would like to close the session. Uh, thank you to two, uh, both the speakers. Yeah, thank you. And I pass the session back to Dr. Umi. Thank, thank you, Dr. Umi. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Thank you very much, Prof. Tay. And thank you, Dr. Aliza Alias, as well as Dr. Liao Chiu Chuan Yi, for a very informative session on the current treatment regime and also the way forward on vaccines for COVID 19. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to our third and last session. To moderate this session, please welcome Professor Dr. Anisapura Ramli, Deputy Director of UITM's Institute of Pathology Laboratory and Forensic Medicine, or IPERFORM. Over to you, Prof. Ani Sapura. Thank you, Dr. Umi, for the introduction. Uh, Assalamualaikum and a very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We have now come to the highlights of this webinar, and it is with great pleasure that I introduce our next esteemed speaker from across the globe in London. How are you, Prof. Azim? I believe you are with us already. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm very well. I hope you can hear, all hear me. Yes, we can hear you. And it, is it 5 a.m. in the morning? It's 5 o'clock. It's like being on, on call again. In, uh, wow. In okay. Okay. Let me uh, introduce you before we invite you to speak on the very interesting topic this afternoon. Professor Dr. Azim Majid is a professor of primary care and public health at the University College London. He is also a general practitioner in an NHS practice in London. He is a world-renowned clinical and public health researcher with specialist medical accreditation in both general practice and public health. While he remains active in clinical practice as a GP, he is also an honorary consultant with Public Health England and the Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust. Professor Azim Majid is currently the head of Department of Primary Care and Public Health at the Imperial College London, where he leads a large and flourishing academic department with around 150 staff with active research, teaching and training programs. Professor Majid has an international reputation for research in primary care and public health. He is um, the co-director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Center for Public Health Education and Training at the Imperial College. And uh, Professor Azim's work, including a WHO technical report on primary health care closing the gap between public health and primary care through integration, which is currently being used by WHO to support the implementation of universal health coverage globally. Um, Professor Azim has also won um, several uh, awards, including being selected as the 50 most influential GPs in the UK by the professional GP magazine Pulse for the past five consecutive years. And in 2017, he won the Lambert CCG Award for Outstanding Contribution to Primary Care. His work on the early detection of disease in Hammersmith and Fulham won the award for primary care and community-based integration at the London Health and Social Care Awards. Professor Azim Majid has also been awarded with over £20 million worth of research grants as principal investigator as well as co-investigator including NIHR Applied Research Collaboration with Northwest London worth £9 million um, until 2024. And Professor Azim has extensively published in leading medical and scientific journals such as the BMJ and the Lancet, 
including COVID-19 related publications. He has more than 700 publications in his Scopus author profile with 44,214 citations and Hitch index of 79. So with that extensive CV, impressive in extensive CV, I now with great pleasure welcome Professor Azim Majid to deliver his talk on COVID-19 from pandemic to endemic. Welcome Prof Azim Majid. Well, thank you very much Professor Anis. I'll, I'll try and share, share my screen. Let me just try and do that. Um, Uh, so hopefully, can you see my screen? Um, can you see my, my slides or not? Uh, yes, we uh, can. Uh, from okay, thank yes. you very much. Yes, please carry uh, on. Uh, thanks. So thank, uh, thank you very much for, for, for uh, this invitation. It's a great pleasure to be uh, at this event. I've been to Malaysia uh, a few times and have uh, very good memories uh, of the country. And I, and I have some good friends also who live in Malaysia who I was in medical school with uh, many years ago. So it's a great pleasure to be here today. Uh, so I'm going to speak about COVID-19 in the United Kingdom uh, from pandemic to endemic and uh, describe what's happening in the UK uh, and then perhaps give some lessons, you know, for other countries as well. Um, so let's move on. Uh, so this is a broad outline. I'll talk about UK experience COVID-19, discuss um, trends in case numbers, uh, hospital admissions, deaths, discuss how the, NH the health service here responded uh, I'll talk also about some ethnic variations in mortality and outcomes as well, uh, and then go on to vaccination before some some conclusions. Uh, so the UK unfortunately has had one of the worst outbreaks of COVID-19 in the world. Uh, so currently the rates in the UK are amongst the highest uh, of any country uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, and we've seen um, roughly three broad waves of infection. There was a first wave at the start of the pandemic uh, in, in March and April of, of last year. Although it looks quite small in this slide, that's because we didn't have much testing back then. So in fact, the rates actually were a lot higher than the than the small uh, number of cases that was uh, shown on the slide would indicate. So there was actually a much higher peak then. Uh, we then had another peak in, in, over, over the winter between November and uh, and February, uh, with over 50,000 cases a day at one point. And then uh, we had then a very steep decline over, over the spring and summer. But then since about June, uh, case numbers have gone up again, unfortunately, and have stayed high. Uh, at around 30 to 50,000 a day, between 30 to 50,000 a day uh, for the last um, few months. So, so the UK uh, has unfortunately had a very bad experience uh, of COVID-19. Uh, uh, this slide just illustrates uh, the, the size of the first peak. So it's a bit complicated, but essentially this is uh, done by my colleagues in, in Imperial College, and it's an antibody-based survey of the UK uh, comparing the peaks of infection uh, at the start of last year to, and towards the end of uh, this year and early this year. So as you can see, we, we had a very big peak uh, early last year, uh, if you look at antibody results rather than testing results, uh, which gives a better indication of the size of the pandemic. <clears throat> uh, the pandemic's also had a big impact on, on our health service. Um, so unfortunately, many people um, became ill, uh, and of those people, uh, a large number had a serious illness that resulted in hospital admission. Uh, and again, we've had three three main uh, peaks of hospital activity, which um, are in line with our peaks of infection. So the first wave in the spring of last year was around um, 20,000 people hospital at one point. Uh, second wave over the winter when we uh, had 35,000 people hospital with COVID-19. And then again, a third smaller wave uh, since um, uh, the late summer um, with around five to 10,000 people hospital at any one time. Uh, and this is you know, this lower third wave is due to the effect of vaccination, which has really suppressed uh, serious, serious illnesses in the UK. But again, it does show that, that, that the, there was a very large impact on our population, on public health, and on our health service uh, in terms of the impact. Um, mortality shows a similar trend. Uh, so if you look at deaths in the UK, um, in the UK, the UK unfortunately has had one of the highest death rates uh, globally in the world uh, from COVID-19 uh, for a number of reasons. So. Uh, again, there's three three peaks of, of, of deaths. The first one was uh, early last year, and then a very big peak in the winter. Um, we, we didn't have vaccines, so there's very high death rate at that time, with over a thousand deaths a day on, on on many days. And then uh, since late summer, we've had a, another increase, um, but this has been kept down through, through vaccination, so it's not as bad as the first two peaks. 
Uh, so, how, so how did the health service respond to this um, challenge? Because uh, clearly this imposed a big strain on the health service in the UK. So um, one shift was it was away from seeing people face to face to seeing people remote by remote consulting models, either by telephone, uh, email or video. So in March last year, the NHS put in a plan whereby most appointments, whether they were GPs or hospital specialists, will be done by video wherever possible or by telephone. Um, we also encourage people to use online services to take pressure off uh, phone lines. So people were encouraged to, um, to to get access to medical records. So they could view their own records, order prescriptions, um, make appointments without going through their through telephone lines. Uh, and the aim was to really to try to minimise face to face contact with uh, with patients and really just see those people who had to be seen and, and thereby reduce risk of infection in healthcare settings. Uh, and so we so after an assessment by telephone and video. Uh, most people were dealt with by that that way, but some were getting called in for an examination if that was needed, and this really helped to contain infection within healthcare settings. <clears throat> uh, we also saw a, quite a big fall off in activity um, last year. So in in both primary care and hospitals, uh, there was quite a big fall in in health service activity uh, around March April last year, um, with around a quarter fall compared to previous uh, numbers, and this was seen across the health system from GP consultations. The hospital emergency departments and outpatient clinics as well. Uh, although since that time things have now gone back to more towards normal, we now have got very high activity in, the, in our health service once again. Um, so the UK is quite fortunate that we have very good IT in terms of uh, medical records in primary care and hospitals, uh, and this really helped cope with the pandemic. Uh, so that many services could be offered online without need for people to come into their their their, 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 their clinics. Um, we also have a system whereby we can send prescriptions to pharmacies electronically. So again, people don't have to come into to their GP surgeries or hospital uh, clinics to get these prescriptions. They can be sent electronically to pharmacies directly for, by their doctors. And this really, the other benefit of this system was that um, it's allowed doctors to work from home. Um, so doctors working from home could access medical records. They could speak to patients. Uh, they could make notes on uh, about patients on the medical record system. And they could issue prescriptions and order tests. And this is very helpful because early on in the pandemic, uh, doctors were often isolating uh, because they were in contact with with a household case or, or a friend or relative who was positive COVID-19 and then to isolate for 10 days. Uh, this allowed them to carry on working while they were at home and to help our health service cope with this um, big surge in demand that we had um, uh, last year. But there was a big impact and, and, and this slide just shows the number of referrals made by GP hospital departments. So, so as you can see, um, uh, in the spring of last year, there was a very big fall to about a quarter of the, of the peak in terms of the number of people who referred each week to hospitals by GPs in England. Uh, there was then a subsequent increase, uh, although it remains it still remains a bit low, but it, it's getting more towards normal again. So there's a big disruption to activity, which has led to big backlogs uh, of patients who need treatment. So we now got 500 people on waiting lists for things like hip replacement surgery, uh, investigation of, of various medical problems, um, treatment for you know for cancer and so on. So it has led to a big backlog. Of, uh, of of care, unfortunately, which is now being slowly cleared. But we estimate this may take years to clear this backlog. It just illustrates that if your pandemic is out of control, your health system really is under great pressure, and you will have a big backlog of care um, to deal with. And in, in the UK's case, this, this may take years to actually try to clear up. Um, unfortunately, one of the um, big impacts of the health of the pandemic was on ethnic minorities in the UK. So we saw a very high death rate uh, amongst ethnic minorities. And in the first wave of the pandemic last year, uh, nearly all the doctors who died uh, were actually um, from ethnic minorities. And, and this is uh, a slide of some of our colleagues who, who, who very tragically died last year. Uh, and you can see most of them are, uh, are non-white and, and from ethnic minorities. So uh, Asian, uh, South Asian, East Asian, uh, African, etc. Uh, and, and we did have a big impact on uh, ethnic minorities in terms of both uh, health professionals, doctors, nurses, and other healthcare professionals, but also the public as well. And this is one of the very sad um, uh, features of the pandemic in the UK. Um, so in the UK, we have fortunately have very good data uh, from our medical records because we are fully computerized. And so we were able to look at things like um, rates of infection by ethnic group and other outcomes. So as you can see, compared to the white group, uh, all the ethnic groups had higher rates of, of infection. So it was black groups, Asian groups, and mixed groups and other groups. And this is a feature of our pandemic and has been uh, ever since it first started. Um, and likewise, if you look at the most severe cases, those who require hospital care 
um, again, uh, there was a great proportion of people amongst the minority groups who, who had COVID-19 required hospital care. So again, a sign that as well as being more likely to be infected, they also more likely to have a serious illness that related to hospital treatment uh, for them. And uh, likewise, if you look at death rates uh, compared to the white group for men and women, uh, again, we find that ethnic minorities have much higher death rates from COVID-19, uh, up to up to three or four times higher in some groups compared to the white British group uh, for, for a range of factors. And, and this, again, has persisted uh, across the pandemic ever since it first started uh, 18 months ago. Uh, so one question we were interested in is, was why were people from black and minority communities more prone to COVID-19 and had worse outcomes? Um, and there are a number of reasons uh, uh, for this. Uh, so one is that uh, people from minority communities are more likely to live in deprived areas, tend to have lower income levels, uh, more likely to live in overcrowded households, households of multi-generational uh, families, so they might have uh, children, parents, grandparents, all living in the same same household, but also more likely to work in jobs that expose them to risk, so more likely to work in healthcare, for example, or in, yeah. uh, in, in shops or, or public transport. Um, but also metabolic and other medical factors that put people at high risk. So people from a South Asian background have high rates of, uh, of metabolic disease, of diabetes, heart disease. People of Black, African and Caribbean origin have higher rates of high blood pressure compared to ethnic groups. And this is one factor um, uh, that could increase uh, the, the risk of, of, of an illness and death in, in this group. Uh, it's also the case that maybe some other issues as well, like access to healthcare, uh, problems with language, people who, who, are, who are not native English speakers, which could also account for some of this difference. Uh, but, it, but even when we model for all these uh, factors, so when we create models that try to adjust for uh, deprivation, income, occupation, medical factors, there's still some unexplained risk in ethnic groups. So uh, for some reason, which we're now trying to investigate through genetic studies and other studies, uh, there's still a high risk of illness and death in people from ethnic minorities in the UK compared to the white British people, even after we uh, you know, carry out complex mathematical models and try to adjust for all these various uh, various factors. Um, so on to uh, vaccination. Um, so the UK was was fortunate that we, we started vaccinating quite early on in the pandemic. So we first started vaccinating uh, in December 2020. So it's uh, almost a year now, about 10 months since we started this uh, this program. Initially with the biotech uh, Pfizer vaccine, uh, later on with AstraZeneca, uh, and, and finally with the, with the Moderna vaccine. So we've got three vaccines uh, that are in use in the UK. Uh, although over time there's been a, uh, a trend to use more Pfizer vaccine and less of the AstraZeneca vaccine for, for various reasons. Um, and this has progressed well, although there are some issues recently with, with the programme, but, but overall the UK has been amongst the leaders in vaccination globally and has vaccinated the majority of adults now uh, over the past uh, 10 months. Now, this is despite problems with supply of vaccines. So early on in the pandemic for the first four or five months, uh, vaccines were in very short supply. Uh, all the vaccines, uh, the main vaccines in use, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, all had prob problems with their with their production, <clears throat> and there were a lot of shortages globally, and it was often hard to get vaccines. Uh, although th these are now largely addressed, and all the manufacturers now have much better supply chains and able to produce vaccines in much bigger quantities than they were um, at the start of the year. There are also some political disputes with our European neighbours about vaccines uh, as well, which I won't go into. But there was a dispute in the UK and the other European countries about um, vaccine exports from Europe, Europe to the UK. But again, that's largely been addressed now, uh, those political problems. So if we look at uh, vaccine coverage um, in the UK, uh, we can see there was quite a, a sharp increase early in the year. Um, and then they're slowing off as we kind of hit a, um, a ceiling. So overall of the population of the UK, uh, about, it's now about seven in 10 have received a vaccine. And amongst adults is about nine in ten. So this graph includes both children and adults. The UK doesn't really vaccinate many children, um, so the overall rate is about seventy percent. But amongst adults, it's about ninety percent now. So we've got, we've got quite good coverage in terms of, um, of of vaccine uptake. But despite that, we're still getting very high rates of infection, unfortunately, from um, from COVID nineteen. So it shows that even with high rates of vaccination, uh, coverage is still very difficult to control if you don't uh, have other measures that, that limit its spread. Um, we do have the problems with uptake of vaccines, um, and so all I've said about nine in ten adults have been vaccinated. Uh, that does vary a lot by age group. Uh, the UK again is very fortunate to have good data on on vaccine uptake and and um, people's views about vaccination. So this slide is from a survey done by our government uh, statistical office, which shows um, people's attitude towards vaccination. 
So as, as you can see, um, a lot of people are most, are most keen on vaccination. And as we move down the age groups, people are less keen to get vaccinated for a number of reasons. So younger people often think that the virus is not a threat to them. Uh, if they get an illness, it won't be that serious. Um, and so they're better off just getting infected rather than the vaccine. And also concerned about side effects of vaccines and, and also a lot, a lot of conspiracy theories as well about vaccines on social media. There are lots of theories about vaccines which aren't true, like the extreme microchips or whatever. So these views are totally more common to younger people. So you, you do find this gradient in, in people's attitudes towards vaccination, which actually is seen globally. So in surveys of other countries um, across the world, we see a similar uh, trend with older people most keen on vaccines and the youngest people tend to be the, the most vaccine hesitant. Uh, we also, within the UK, see quite big differences by ethnic group in terms of vaccination attitudes. So again, this is with us survey, this time looking by ethnic group. And again, as you can see, um, there's quite a big variation between ethnic groups and attitude, attitudes towards vaccination. So it's the white British group that's most likely to get vaccinated uh, and the ethnic groups who are less keen on vaccination. And this is something I've seen in my own medical practice in London. So amongst the white patients, we have a very high take of vaccine. Amongst the minority patients, the vaccine take up is much, much slower. It's much harder work to convince them to get vaccinated. And uh, it is a concern because, as we've shown, those patients have a high risk of infection and also of, of uh, serious illness and death. So it's quite worrying for us that um, that the uptake of vaccine is, is quite low amongst some minority communities, uh, particularly in London, which is our most diverse uh, city, and that does place them and London uh, at risk of, of future outbreaks of COVID-19 if that's not, not addressed. Uh, there are a lot of questions about vaccination. So people do have you know, a series of questions uh, which they ask their doctors and health professionals. So one question is, how long does it last after vaccination? That's a very important question. Uh, how do vaccines work against new variants? Uh, do we need booster doses? Uh, what are the long-term outcomes of vaccination? How do we identify rare side effects, uh, which will be serious? And how do we use this data to improve confidence of vaccines? The UK fortunately has very good data on vaccine uptake. And that can be linked with our medical records of 50 million people to outcomes uh, like infection, uh, test for infection or, or, um, or, or mortality. Uh, so actually, these questions can be addressed with, with our data. And the UK is now running some very large studies using our health service data linked to testing data and people's demographic data to try to address some of these questions about how long immunity lasts. So the first question, how long it lasts, our data is showing after around five, six months immunity does begin to wear off somewhat, particularly in older people. Um, and so we've now uh, got a program to provide booster doses to those people, which has just started recently. So people over 50, uh, healthcare workers and people with medical problems, and now receive a third dose of COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, and and we'll, that's something we'll keep on monitoring in, in the future with our data. So because we have, we have a large population, you know, 50 or 60 million people, um, and very good data, it's something that, that, we, that we can actually uh, Monitor and evaluate through our, through our, through, through research, and, and so it's an important question. But our data does show that after six months there is a drop off in in, in protection, particularly with the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, perhaps more so than the Pfizer Moderna, and Moderna vaccines. <clears throat> in terms of new new variants, um, uh, again our data has looked at this, and, and what we've shown is that uh, with a new Delta variant, which is more infectious than the previous variants, uh, one dose of vaccine is less effective against stopping infection or preventing serious illness. But fortunately, if you have two doses um, or a third booster dose, that does then increase protection quite substantially. Uh, and so even against the new Delta variants, um, two doses of vaccine um, do work very well, uh, although it's, um, it's the case that one dose works less well than against the previous uh, variants that circulated uh, until recently. In terms of boosters, um, the UK is rolling out a booster program now. It does look very likely that we might need annual boosters for COVID-19. Um, so it, does, it will change our life, unfortunately, going forwards. Uh, so as with flu vaccine, uh, many people may well need an annual booster to protect them from ongoing, ongoing risk of infection. Uh, we're also looking at long-term effects of, of, uh, of vaccinations. We're looking at um, long-term side effects. Again, the data is showing there are short-term side effects, but long-term side effects seem to be quite rare. So most side effects seem to occur in, in the first few weeks after uh, vaccination, you know, such as uh, the milder side effects like uh, myalgia, um, shivering, and so on, and and the rare side effects like uh, clotting disorders or or cardiomyopathy or, or myocarditis, um, and and because we have these large data systems, we can identify these these problems, and hopefully this data will then improve 
people's confidence in vaccines and, and overcoming people's vaccine hesitancy. And I'll probably skip this slide, um, so I'll just move on a bit. So I have done quite a lot of work you know, around, uh, uh, as, uh, as, this, uh, as I said earlier, around this. So um, we, we are looking at um, uh, how we improve vaccine confidence, vaccine hesitancy. It is a problem in the UK, it's a problem globally as well. So many, many people you know, globally are not keen on vaccination. They're very suspicious of vaccines, particularly COVID-19 vaccines, because they're developed very, very quickly uh, within a year. Um, and so you know, we, are, we are working to understand why people have these views and how we can actually address that views. Because as many people have said, vaccines might work you know, really well, but if people refuse to take them, then they won't work at all for those people. So it's very important we do address people's concerns about vaccines, improve their confidence, and really um, uh, try to get vaccination rates up to high levels. As I mentioned, we're also working on looking at the long-term side effects of, uh, of vaccines. This is one of my papers in which we discussed that work. So using linked medical records in the UK, uh, which link data from GPs, hospitals, uh, laboratories, and, and testing uh, systems, we can actually then look at uh, things like uh, breakthrough infections or side effects. Uh, so really get good data on long, longer term safety and efficacy of these vaccines, which will be uh, very valuable for long term uh, public health planning. So as I've shown, the data already show a decline in protection after around six months, and that's then led to the UK introducing its booster programme of the third vaccine for many people. And this is one of my articles from the BMJ, British Medical Journal, showing uh, this is about uh, this is for health professionals showing how they can work with with with, with the public and patients to address vaccine hesitancy. So, so so what kind of things you can do to understand why people have concerns about vaccines and how those can be addressed to improve um, people's uptake of vaccines. So it's available online if you want to read that paper uh, free of charge. Um, as I mentioned, um, the UK is fortunate that we've got good data. Uh, and we have now a new body called the Health Security Agency, which has been tasked with publishing data, in fact, weekly on vaccine uptake and vaccine effectiveness. Uh, so we have almost real time data coming through on how uh, these vaccines are being used in the population, what the take up is in different groups, whether it's by age or by ethnic group, and what the uh, and how effective these vaccines are. So again, this is available online. Each week, you can look at this report and see what the latest data shows. Um, this slide just shows the vaccine effectiveness based on this data. So, the, so this is from, from a very large sample of patients, you know, millions, tens of millions of people who've had vaccinations now, looking at risk of infection, uh, all infections, infections with symptoms, uh, infections requiring hospital treatment and mortality. Um, so the green, uh, if it's green, it means it's very strong confidence. It means there's very good data, enough numbers to provide accurate estimates. Uh, the other color implies that the, the data is fairly accurate, but, but, but we need a bit more time and more data to, to ascertain uh, how, how accurate the, 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 the data is. So, so as you can see for infection, um, the two main vaccines in use in the UK, the Pfizer vaccine and the AstraZeneca vaccine, do provide good protection against infection, so do reduce risk of infection quite substantially, uh, by up to 85% for the Pfizer vaccine and 70% for the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, they have a high protection against symptomatic illness, uh, so the first, the first uh, row includes uh, people who are not symptomatic, so for people with, with no symptoms, the protection is even better. So um, they do really suppress symptoms. And, and so if people get an illness, it's often very mild with no symptoms. And for the Pfizer vaccine, it, it's up to nice and effective in stopping infection with symptoms. Uh, and similar with Moderna and perhaps a bit less with AstraZeneca. In terms of, in terms of two main outcomes, the most serious outcomes, uh, admission hospital and death, all the vaccines show excellent protection. So we're finding about 90% plus protect reduction in, in admission rates, hospital and death rates, when people are fully vaccinated. Uh, so this is excellent news. You know, it does imply that if we get these vaccines rolled out so in the UK and globally, we can really suppress serious cases of illness and, and really bring down uh, people requiring hospital care and, and people who are dying quite substantially. So it's important, I think, for, the, for all countries in the world to see this data and, and show their public that actually these vaccines are highly effective in stopping uh, the most serious cases of infection, uh, which lead to hospitalization or um, or death. Um, so in terms of overall, uh, the UK has you know, mixed mixed success in in this uh, pandemic. Um, we unfortunately had one of the highest uh, death rates and infection rates in the world, um, which we, which wasn't great. Um, but on the other hand, the health service did generally cope with this, although it wasn't a pressure. We also have 
will increase testing capacity substantially. The UK now has one of the highest testing capacities in the world. We can do a million tests or more per day now for COVID-19 because of big investment in testing systems uh, and laboratories. And the vaccine program has started quite well and is proceeding quite well um, at the moment, although there are, there are some issues that I won't go into. But we also had a lot of problems as well. So early on in the pandemic, we didn't have much testing uh, available. So it meant that um, early last year, on between March and June, most people who were infected did not get a test. And so um, it wasn't really clear if they had COVID or some other, uh, other virus because of, of the lack of testing at, at that time. But so we now have two million tests a day potentially in the UK, so we can test most people who have symptoms. Uh, we unfortunately had a very death rate in nursing homes uh, last year, so we have most hospitals discharged patients to clear their, their wards for the pandemic. Um, some of those people actually were infected with COVID-19, and when they were discharged in nursing homes, uh, there was a very high death rate in nursing homes, up to a third of people dying in some in some nursing homes. Uh, we've also had quite poor contact tracing, so I think countries like Malaysia have done much better in terms of contact tracing and isolation and quarantine than the UK. Public here was never very keen to isolate. You know, uh, if they were informed, they were contact. Uh, so I think you know other countries like Malaysia, I think, have done much better here than than the UK. Uh, there's also quite a centralised approach from governments, which again caused some problems because it meant there wasn't local flexibility in, in response or in contact tracing. And there was quite a big um, economic impact in the UK with a big decline in, 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 in the economy, about 20% uh, early last year. Although that's largely now recovered, but it was a big, there was a big impact on the economy, which illustrates that if you don't control the pandemic, it does actually affect your economy, which has, has other effects as well. Uh, the other negative effects, things like school closures, so it had a big impact on children. So schools over the last 18 months have been closed for large periods, and that really impacted children, particularly from poorer families who, who have fallen behind in education. And vaccine uptake remains a problem in some groups. Uh, so overall, the UK is doing quite well. There are some population groups which have quite low uptake, particularly in London, um, and that will uh, cause us problems if, if that does not change in the future. Um, so, so what's the future hold for the UK? Uh, the government in the UK has really now moved to a policy of trying to live with COVID-19. Um, so unlike some countries like New Zealand, you know, which are trying to suppress rates and keep them down to a very, very low level, the government here is just sort of saying, well, we're just trying to live with it through vaccination. Um, and so they're, kind of, they're accepting that we'll have, we're going to have a bigger thousand deaths a week potentially uh, in the UK uh, over the winter from COVID-19, perhaps even higher. Uh, but they're very uh, unkeen to bring in new measures. Uh, so the strategy of the government is really to try to live with COVID-19 rather than adopt approaches seen elsewhere in the world, um, in places like uh, you know, Malaysia, Taiwan, uh, New Zealand, where they're trying to suppress it to very low, low levels. Uh, we are now current with a vaccine program. So, so we've now started vaccinating children um, of 12 to 15 years of age. We're also offering booster doses for um, people over 50, healthcare workers and those medical problems. And some people who are severely immunocompromised will get uh, four doses of vaccine, so that's three primary doses plus a booster to try to boost their immune response. And we're also investing in new antiviral agents. So the government has, uh, in fact, just ordered um, a large quantity of antiviral agents. Uh, these are oral, oral drugs uh, for use in the UK. So the, the idea is that when people are assessed for COVID-19 early on, uh, those who are high risk uh, can be given one of these new antiviral agents, uh, which are just coming through now. So the, the RCTs are just, be, just being completed and they should be licensed for use in the UK very soon. Um, so the idea is people will be assessed in a, in a, in a COVID clinic. And if you're a high-risk person, for example, if you're older, uh, say over 50 or 60, or if you've got a medical problem, but you're high risk, you will then be offered uh, one of these oral antiviral agents, uh, as well as uh, having a vaccine. Um, and the idea is that uh, this will then uh, suppress uh, uh, infection, uh, death rates even further um, through the use of these drugs. That's something we plan to introduce over the next few months across the UK, but it's not a, not a cheap option. Um, the drugs are going to cost uh, hundreds of millions of pounds to uh, to, to, to buy and use. Um, the government here is not keen on mask wearing and making it compulsory. So unlike in other, many other countries, uh, mask wearing here is not compulsory in indoor spaces like shops or, or public transport. Um, so again, it's something which, you know, which I don't agree with, but the government here is, for its political reasons, doesn't want to make mask wearing compulsory. Uh, and so it's really voluntary, which means many people don't do it. Uh, they're also looking to introduce vaccine passports. Uh, so many European countries, if you want to go into a restaurant, um, a club or, or into, a, into a concert, you've got your proof of vaccination to be allowed in 
uh, to that kind of venue to reduce risk of an outbreak there. The government here is not very keen on that idea. Um, again, some people like myself think it's a good idea, but the government is, is not doing that. Um, the UK is now in a very sensitive time, although we've got good vaccination rates and the, and the promise of new oral antiviral agents being introduced uh, later this year. Uh, we do face over the winter the possibility that we'll see a large increase in cases and that then will lead to a, a rise in hospitalizations and deaths uh, despite our um, uh, high vaccine coverage. So we are at a very sensitive time in the UK. So uh, I think lessons where the countries are is don't follow follow our examples in data collection and research, but perhaps don't follow our policies and things like contact tracing or mask wearing or vaccine passports where we've not done so well. So the UK I think is a mixed bag in terms of um, COVID-19. So we've, we've done very well in research and surveillance but less well in, I think, in control measures uh, compared to some other countries. Uh, so yeah, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stop there. So I'll just stop sharing. Thank you very much, uh, Prof Azim and yeah, Majid. Yeah, yes. stop sharing. I'm not, I'm not sure to do that. Um, no problem. You can leave your slides there. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll just... Uh, Okay, so we have plenty of time for question and answer, actually, because your session uh, doesn't end until about 1.15. So are you okay to take questions? Oh, yeah, that's fine, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. okay, excellent. Thank you, uh, Prof Majid, for sharing with us um, UK's experience in terms of your response um, for COVID-19 um, pandemic. So I will now open the floor for question. Is there any from our participants? I can't see any question in the chat box. You can ask Anis, uh, yes. can I start? Yes, sure. Yes, sure. Thank you very Prof. much. Thank Abu you, Abu Professor Abu Azim. I'm Professor Abu Bakr. Uh, thank you so much for accepting, uh, accepting our invitation to speak in the early hours of London time. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Azim, uh, recently there was a report by the Parliamentary Committee of, uh, I think, UK Parliament regarding the performance of the government in response to COVID-19 in the early period of the uh, uh, pandemic. Um, of course, uh, this was actually discussed quite at length in our one of our local radio station. And uh, um, someone from the UK was invited to uh, crit critic on, on the report. And I think the, it is also uh, covered by uh, BMJ editorial last week, I think. And there is a statement saying the most important public health failures the United Kingdom has ever experienced. Uh, of course, I think with reports like this, there is always this benefit of uh, hindsight from the investigator's point of view. Uh, do you think that this report has been overly harsh on the government's performance in uh, with COVID-19? Yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, I think overall it's uh, probably accurate, although it's always easy with hindsight you know, to reach conclusions when you're 18 months into the pandemic. I think at the start of la the pandemic last year, in March in March last year, the government was very, very slow to bring in a lockdown. Uh, and so there was a lot of calls for lockdowns from public health specialists and clinicians. Um, the government really delayed by a few weeks. And in those few weeks, the infection really spread across the country and infection numbers really rose to a high level. So I think the, the, main, the main complaint people have was the government was slow to act uh, last, in, in March last year and should have brought lockdown in about two weeks earlier which may have saved a lot more lives. Um, we also slowed to bring lockdown in again towards the end of last year. Um, we had another lockdown. Again, the government was, wasn't very keen to have a lockdown. They delayed by a few weeks. Again, in those few weeks, there was a big spread of um, infections across the country. Uh, and so I think those are the two main failings, to not, not bring lockdowns early enough. You know, again, again, it's always easier with hindsight to you know, reach that conclusion, but the view of most public health specialists and clinicians was lockdowns should have been brought in quicker. Uh, also, we've done very badly on contact tracing. So the UK contact tracing has done very, very badly. Um, so we spent billions of pounds on contact tracing systems, but despite the huge amount of money that's gone to contact tracing, we've still done very, very, very poorly here uh, compared to many other countries. So it was a big failure. I mean, as I mentioned in the U earlier on in my talk, UK has one of the world's highest death rates. So if you, if you use that as a, as a measure of how well your government's managed the pandemic, we've done very badly in the UK, we're amongst the worst countries in the world. Um, in terms of managing it, if you, in terms of deaths, uh, for example. Uh, paradoxically, despite that, we, we're one of the top countries in terms of research. 
Uh, so we have this paradox that we have very strong public health research programs, but at the same time our government doesn't very badly in, in the practical aspects of managing a pandemic. Thank you, Professor Thank, Thank you, you Prof. Majin. Yeah. Um, okay, since there is no question from the participants, I also have got a question for you, Prof. Majid, if you don't mind. Okay, uh, the UK, as we all know, has one of the best uh, universal health uh, coverage in the world in terms of um, UHC scoring by WHO in terms of free access at the point of care covered by the national insurance and general taxation. It means that the general public is able to access the care free at the point of care under the NHS for primary care and secondary care. Yeah. So what is your comment about uh, cases of catastrophic healthcare expenditure in the UK because of COVID-19? Do you see any cases at all where families that has actually gone bankrupt due to hospital admissions um, in, uh, due to COVID-19 in the UK? Your comment on that? People have suffered uh, financially, but not through healthcare costs. So because the UK has free healthcare, both primary care and hospital care, um, people people don't pay for those. And, and so there's not really any case people going bankrupt because of uh, hospital care. But people have obviously, there was a big impact on the economy. Uh, many people lost their jobs. Um, and so there was an impact on people that way. So if you lost your job, for example, your income would certainly drop. It's also the case that um, in some jobs, if, if you don't go to work, you don't get paid, uh, particularly in lower paid jobs like um, cleaning, for example. Uh, and so there was a problem in that some people still went to work despite being sick because if they didn't go to work, they, they wouldn't get paid. And so that also, I think, encouraged the spread of infection. So I think healthcare wasn't really a big issue in terms of costs. But I think where the government failed compared to other European countries was in perhaps not paying people who were sick to isolate because some people who are sick, I know, went to work because otherwise they wouldn't get any money. And if, if you're a low paid person and you don't go to work, you know, then you've got the money to pay for your expenses. And so I think the government could have probably stepped in to offer more financial support to people who are isolating to stop them losing out on uh, on their income. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, in Malaysia, as, um, as you probably uh, know, uh, we have a dual system of public and private healthcare system, more or less like the United States of America. Um, so during the COVID-19 pandemic in Malaysia, um, when the public hospital beds were full, uh, the general public um, has no choice but actually to access the private healthcare. And they actually have to pay out of pocket uh, for the hospital admissions. And they were shocked to receive the bills of hundreds of thousands of Malaysian ringgits. And um, so it is a big research question. How much is some um, catastrophic healthcare expenditure where families actually gone bankrupt because of COVID-19 admissions to private hospitals in Malaysia? So moving forward, uh, Prof um, uh, Majid, um, for countries like Malaysia, we've been working, trying to achieve universal health coverage to integrate the public and private healthcare system, I think for the past 15 years, we've, we're not getting anywhere. And um, there will there is a need for big problem. It is difficult, you know, there are many countries in the world where there isn't universal health coverage, like the USA, for example. In the UK, we, it came into place in 1948, but that was a special time, time because World War II had just ended, and so there was a lot of feeling of solidarity. I think without World War II, it's possible the UK might not have had <laughs> national health service. Um, you know, so, so even here, it, was, it took a big event like World War II to trigger uh, uh, universal health coverage. So it is difficult. I mean, across Europe now, um, countries generally have universal health coverage in some way, not quite the same as the UK, but um, they, they might have insurance-based systems or systems with small co-payments. But typically, certainly in Western Europe, healthcare is generally either free or access to very low cost. So it depends partly, I think, you know, just on, on the political will. Uh, the government has to decide it wants to have universal health coverage and then implement that. Often doctors aren't very, some doctors aren't very keen on this because they lose their private practice. So that was one problem in the UK when we got to health service, was that many doctors weren't happy because they lost their private practice. Um, but in the end, you know, it's up to the government, I think, to decide. And, and this is what happened in Western Europe. Most countries reporting over the last 50 years, you know, health coverage uh, uh, with either no, no cost or very low cost uh, fees to, to pay it to the public. Yeah, so it took the world. It's a global to... challenge. It's a global challenge. You know, it's not just Malaysia. 
It's almost everything it, it in the is, world. It is really, yeah. It, it took the World War II to to es uh, establish the NHS in 1948, right? So we probably need to have a, a catastrophic <laughs> event like that. <laughs> Another World War. <laughs> no, no, we don't, we don't wish for that. Yeah, okay, yeah, it is, it's a huge problem worldwide. Uh, thank you, Prof. Azim. So that's my question. So is there any more questions from the participants today? We have about 100 participants with us this afternoon, staying with us uh, until now. Any more questions? Um, anyway, people, have, if you want to again touch, just they always email me. If they're going to have to have more answers to so, ask questions, but if then there's none, can I uh, have another question, Professor? Certainly, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, back to your final slide on the way forward or the future, what the future holds. Um, and this morning, we were talking about this uh, earlier also. This morning, I heard on the BBC World Service regarding the prediction by some of the health professionals that the number of cases in the UK can go back up to about 100 cases, 100,000 cases per day. And you mentioned in your slides regarding um, the importance of uh, re, uh, the numbers uh, uh, going up probably in the winter. Um, I would think that the UK would already have a very good uh, prediction uh, system or tools, predictive tools, uh, for the community to um, impress the government that this prediction, you know, is uh, quite valid and should be looked at very seriously. But I'd be surprised uh, if, um, I mean, um, looking at the current uh, ways uh, things going on in the UK, there is no uh, strong emphasis on so-called SOPs, uh, even like you mentioned, uh, asking for compulsory to put on the mask is not something which is acceptable. So I would think with a good predictive model, which we discussed this morning actually in terms of uh, when uh, it comes to endemic, that would be a, a strong basis for the government or the public to take uh, action in preventing future um, you know, increase in, in number of cases. Yeah, thank you, Professor It's a very good question. UK is very split politically. So there are many people in government and in, in, the, in society who are opposed to these restrictions. They, they don't want face masks. They don't want uh, any kind of control measures, vaccine passports. In fact, even, some people even post vaccination as well. Um, and so the government politically has a large number of MPs who don't want face masks, who don't want vaccine passports, who don't want more control measures. We think we can live with the virus, but the problem with living with the virus, as we know, is that it can easily get out of control. And suddenly, you've got you know thousands dying every day, as you, you know, thousands more dying than we saw, as you saw in January in the UK when there's over thousands dying every day. Um, and, and so there is this tension between public health specialists and the government. You know, the public health community want the government to act quickly. The government doesn't want to act. You know, MPs are saying, um, you know, don't act, just live with the virus. Or vaccination will will control it uh, through vaccination. But vaccination by itself, you know, I think is not enough. You need other, other measures with vaccination. Uh, so vaccination clearly is the most important measure, but we need other things as well. But the government, you know, is very loath to introduce any, any new measures, uh, probably because it's too late, as, as we saw last uh, in the last two waves of infection. Hey, no problem. I hope your government's more sensible than, than our government. <laughs> So, Pramajit, do you think that the initial initiative by the UK government to go for the herd immunity was was were right in the beginning? What is your comment about uh, trying no, to I, achieve a herd immunity? Yeah, that no, wasn't uh, right. I mean, herd immunity uh, just means a lot of people get sick and a lot of people will, will die. So, the UK has had over, over 100,000 people have died in the UK from COVID-19. I think it's 150,000 have died. Um, you know, so it's not, it's not a good outcome. Also, we have long COVID as well. So, as well as those who have died, we, we call people who've got long-term symptoms of COVID-19. Uh, you know, people are very disabled from ongoing problems like weakness, car, you know, cardiac problems, and um, you know, kidney disease, and so on. Um, so we've got uh, this problem of long COVID as well, which is really a big issue in the UK as well. So it's not just the, it's not just the deaths; it's also those people left with long-term complications as well, which is a big issue for us. So I think herd immunity is not a good option. Immunity you know, through vaccination is always, always better. 
were you were you involved in the um, that study that uh, the the modeling uh, to show that hundreds of thousands of people uh, were uh, yeah, that was my, uh, wasn't uh, directly involved. It was one of my colleagues, Preston Neil Ferguson, with that works. He works in one of my other departments at Royal College. So it was done by different <laughs> different departments. Different, uh, different uh, department. Of, uh, but it, it, it was the, a study from the Imperial College, right? Yeah, from the same. Um, it's from the same public health school. So we're all in the same School of Public Health. So it was from my other colleagues in a different section of the School of Public Health who did that yeah. work. We're so not that really, the, yeah. the pandemic, that, that triggered the lockdown last year when the government saw the number of deaths that might, that might occur without a lockdown. Uh, at that point, we were not keen to have a lockdown until they saw those those estimates. Yeah, that's yeah. So that changed. That really changed the government's direction after it that. Did, yeah, changed it almost in like a you know two days. They changed their policy based on those estimates when they saw. How many yeah. people might die through a positive herd immunity? And yeah. so they switched to having a lockdown. Yeah. Uh, Prof Majid, I'm actually pretty impressed with the rollout of vaccinations in the UK. I mean, despite the slow response of, you know, reluctance for lockdown, I must say that UK is one of the best countries in terms of vaccination rollout. And I think because you do have the NHS GPs um, being empowered to uh, vaccinate the, the patients, because all the patients there are registered with a GP. Right, unlike uh, countries like Malaysia, where there is no family physician looking after a patient. Uh, so, what's your comment about that? Because there's a quick rollout, and I think the criticism against Malaysia at that time was a very slow rollout of um, COVID-19 vaccination. So, if you could en uh, enlighten us with the role of GPs there in uh, vaccinating the country in a, such a short time. Yeah, the role of GPs is very important. So, GPs in the end vaccinated about three quarters of people in the UK. So, about three quarters of vaccines were given by GPs and, and their staff. Uh, the key thing, I think, was given the local flexibility. So they all organised their own clinics. Uh, they worked evenings and weekends. They got volunteers to help them uh, from from the community. Uh, so the key really was giving them local flexibility. Um, so they're given the vaccines, but, but were then left to organise how they contact their patients, how they run their clinics, how they recruited volunteers to help them. Uh, so yeah, the GPs and, and other primary care staff did very well. And, and as I mentioned, you know, around three quarters of vaccines were given by GPs. And their teams in the UK, so that, that was a big, I think, I think a big positive um, about the UK. I think if it's done by by large vaccine centres where people don't really know the, the staff, you get a much lower uptake. But if you're a doctor ringing you up or calling you to a vaccine, you might like to turn up a thing than if it's some stranger who asked you to turn up. So the, that was one of the positives about the UK was the way the GP stepped into deliver vaccines and you know really working nights, weekends, and in their own time. Uh, to do that uh, over this over the wind last winter spring and into the summer yeah that was uh, pretty impressive and as um, for the benefit of the audience um, all the gps in the uk has got membership of the royal college so they are really specialists unlike uh, probably gps in malaysia they probably have got basic medical degree um so we're trying i mean i'm in the same profession as you are actually i was trained as a gp in the uk came back with mrc gp in Malaysia, unfortunately, the bulk majority of our general practitioners uh, actually have got basic medical degree, and we've been um, trying to convince the government to introduce the um, compulsory training for general practice in Malaysia, which we, we are not successful to. The, to yeah. Well, that's to very this. important. In, in the UK, it takes five years now to train as GP. Um, so it's, a five, it's two years as a financial doctor and three years GP training. So it's a five year program to qualify as GP here, and you've got to pass the exam as well at yeah. the end of it. So. Yeah, it's quite yeah. a rigorous training program. Yeah, and the good thing is uh, the MRC GP UK is a recognised specialist qualification in the Malaysia by our National Specialist okay. Register for Family Medicine. So that's excellent that way. Yeah, so we can see here the role of GP is very, very important. The role of primary care physician is very important in, as Prof uh, Majid has mentioned to us all, uh, regarding vaccination as well as now you are busy delivering the booster uh, vaccines, is it not, to the population? That's right, we just got the booster dose recently in September, so that's just um, just being rolled out. In fact, I had my booster two weeks ago, so I had my booster already <laughs> two weeks ago. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so I, I know you covered in your talk just now, but personal choice, uh, do you think that we should go for the same uh, vaccine for booster or we should choose a, a um, different kind? UK has, choice? has moved away, is now going to use, use many Pfizer vaccines for boosters. So, um, so in, in the first wave, we used a mix of Pfizer and AstraZeneca vaccines. Um, so for AstraZeneca for older people, Pfizer for younger people. For this booster program for children, um, we're using almost entirely Pfizer vaccines along with some Moderna vaccines. The UK has largely stopped using 
the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, it's mainly using Pfizer vaccines. I see. Okay. So if you're an adult who had Pfizer vaccine, then uh, for the booster, you have a choice between Pfizer or AstraZeneca or? Uh, no, no, you, you, you'll get Pfizer. Okay. Um, so it's, it's almost all Pfizer vaccine being used now in the UK. Oh, I see. Okay. So is that, is, is not licensed for? Uh, it's licensed, but it's not used very much. It was used earlier on in the year, but now it's used on a small number of people who can't take Pfizer vaccine, you know, sort of analogy to first vaccine. Uh, so that we've, now, we've now been using Pfizer vaccines, and whereas earlier on in the year we were using a lot of AstraZeneca vaccines, uh, we're now using many Pfizer, which means we've now got a large surplus of AstraZeneca vaccines. Of, of Astra. Is there still a, a fear of um, um, thromboembolic events with uh, AZ uh, in the UK? Yeah, there is that concern. I mean, both vaccines have got concerns. So with, with the AstraZeneca, there's a concern about thromboembolic disease. With Pfizer, there's a concern about uh, myocarditis. So both vaccines, yeah, I've got some some concerns uh, about them. Unfortunately, those both events are very very rare. Fortunately, so you know, very very small number of cases. But it does the media does stoke the fear sometimes. The media will, you know, have headlines about the the dangers. But in fact, in, in, in the, in the case numbers are very very low for both side effects for both vaccines. Excellent. Okay, um, Dato, Prof. Dato Baka, do you have any more questions before we end the session? Or anyone uh, in the audience? Oh, yes. Is there anyone else who wishes to ask questions? Uh, otherwise, I just want to um, just get your comment regarding, I mean, this is a general uh, question probably. Um, we have with us today uh, researchers at University of Mara or UITM. Um, some have previous, previously asked me whether there's any opportunity to collaborate, for example, in terms of research. Would you provide some advice on how we can collaborate with uh, with yourself or uh, or, or Imperial College? Yeah, uh, yeah, happy to, um, yeah please, yeah. thank you. Um, um, I think one part of our the pandemic is that we're now much more used to these video meetings than we were two years ago. So in fact, it's now easy to collaborate because we can have video calls with people. You know, two years ago, we rarely had any video meetings with anybody. And now this is how we do everything else by video. So yeah, so if anyone wants to get in touch, just send me an email, I'm happy to um, then perhaps arrange a video call with somebody if they, if they want to email me. Thank you, Prof. Prof. Anis has got a project with uh, your colleague in the UK, right, Prof. Anis? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, do you happen to know Professor Nadim Qureshi at the University yeah, of Yeah, Montenegro? I do know him, yes. Yeah. You do know him? Fact, I'm, uh, I'm examining his PhD student next in, in January, so I do know him. <laughs> so I'm examining one of his students quite soon in, in January. Wow, okay, what a small world, yeah. Uh, oh, we yeah. yeah. We recently had a grant together on the, the UK-Malaysia joint um, non-communicable disease grant working on familial hypercholesterolemia. Uh, he developed this um, novel tool called the FEMCAT, which is um, being tested in the UK general practice now. Uh, so we're very lucky uh, to be the first country outside the UK um, to have the FEMCAT being tested in the, our Malaysian uh, primary, primary health care uh, system. So we are collecting data now and hopefully we can uh, come up with um, joint publications together to share okay, our good. findings. Good. Well, so, well done. Thank you. Yeah, so perhaps we can um, explore um, research collaborations together with yeah. uh, Imperial College too. Uh, it, your area of interest, is it real infectious diseases or NCD? Uh, it's more um, a long-term condition, so, you know, Cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension, so prevention, diagnosis, management of those long term conditions. But in the past 18 months, I've also done a lot of work around COVID 19 as well. Uh, but that wasn't in my original plan. It was just because the pandemic suddenly occurred. Like everyone else, we had to suddenly start working on COVID 19 as well as our other work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, being a generalist, we cannot avoid it. So it seems that we have similar interests in terms of, um, we call it chronic disease management in the UK, is it not living with a long term yeah. condition? with uh, the non-communicable diseases, as you mentioned, which is a high, huge burden uh, in, in Malaysia. Um, so that's excellent. I, I'm sure we'll be in touch again uh, because I'm from the Faculty of Medicine um, in UITM and um, we have a, a journal called the Journal of Clinical and Health Sciences and we are the, going to uh, organize um, a conference um, on behalf of the journal in January or February next year. With, um, and we're actually looking for speakers to speak on uh, COVID-19. The, the theme is COVID-19 again. So I'll probably be in touch with you to speak okay. again, if, yeah, if you don't mind. Happy to speak. 
Yeah, yeah, in for January and for February next year. Yeah, but I'll I'll definitely be in touch with you. Thank you very much. Can I add just one more point, uh, Prof. Uh, Anis? Uh, Prof. Sure. Azim, thank you so much again. I I suggest that participants here you can also, if you have Twitter account, you can follow Prof. Azim's account. I think uh, the tweets are always very uh, useful, very uh, eye-opening, and very uh, and up to date. So follow uh, the Twitter account of Prof. Azim. I would recommend. Thank you. It. Thank you. Hope everyone has a nice lunch. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs> okay. So if there is no more question, um, then we pro perhaps can end this um, session. It's been wonderful, uh, Prof. Azim Majid, to have uh, you with us uh, this afternoon all the way from London at probably 6 a.m. in the morning now. It's 6 a.m. now, yeah. 6 a.m. now. Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Prof. Azim Majid, on behalf of the thank organizers. You, you. We well. hope Good to meet you again you someday. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Professor Azim Majid and Professor Anissa Pura for the very significant sharing and insight. Alhamdulillah, we have come to the end of the webinar. On behalf of the Office of Deputy Vice Chancellor Research and Innovation UITM, I would like to again extend our appreciation to all our invited speakers and moderators, especially and also especially to the participants that have made the time to join us this morning. I believe we have all learned a lot and benefited from the sharing by our experts. To echo Professor Nazib this morning, we also hope that this effort shall open up future collaborations, particularly on our local COVID-19 response, as well as other research areas. So Prof Anis and Prof Azim has, uh, you know, uh, really shown us that this is possible. So hopefully many more um, collaborations will um, uh, bloom yeah, from this webinar. Uh, this webinar, for your information, is also broadcasted on the YouTube channel of Pajabat PNCPI UITM and therefore will be available for future viewing. So please share as much of the information, if not the whole webinar itself, with your family and friends. Together, inshallah, with adequate information and awareness, we will enter the endemic phase as a stronger nation moving forward. Until next time, thank you once again. Stay safe. Assalamualaikum and have a good day. Thank you.